Dacus. Um, I'm not sure, are there any, any Greek Orthodox churches in Portland that have the really nice interior carvings? Sometimes, okay, that, um, either Russian or Orthodox churches a lot of times have this, what they call Byzantine style carving. And uh, that, that's what he taught me how to do and using these long handled gouges. And um, uh, so I studied with him for three years and really learned that very traditional European style. Now he started when he was about 12 years old in Greece and quit school. And that was what he was gonna do for the rest of his life. I just wonder now if, we, if any of the 12 year olds now will would be able to know exactly what they're gonna do. And at 12 years old, I know I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast back then, but you know, <laughs> that's too tall. <laughs> um, had no talent either, so. Um, but, uh, you know, you think about that to, to actually make a decision at 12 years old and you have to stick with that. And for the next seven years, then he became an uh, apprentice. Uh, and then seven years after that, he did the traditional journeyman where you basically journey around and you um, basically study at different places or work with, work at different locations. And so doesn't, there's really not much of that type of, of teaching anymore. Um, this doesn't seem to be going again. Oops, meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, Brad. Okay. All right. So this is one of the things that I, um, when I first started, I really wanted to carve things to make it look like they were moving, you know, I carve something in the solid um, material and just carve life into it. And so that's why I really enjoyed making, carving flames and leaves that looked like they were kind of twisting around. And that was one of my very first carvings that I did kind of my own design. And this is my first carving commission. I think I got like $60 for it. <laughs> and uh, it's a umbrella stand with uh, elephants on it and little baby elephant sitting there. And uh, it was fun, um, but this was, it, um, if you if you have um, my carving the acanthus leaf book, this is uh, the book that I wrote um, uh, about four years ago. Now one of there's whoops one of the stories in it was how I almost made my uh, neighbor have a nervous breakdown because it was like three o'clock in the morning and I had a mallet and I was so into my work and I'm pounding and pounding and pounding and just hacking away at this thing at three o'clock in the morning and. Finally, I hear this like bang on the door, like I can't take the bath anymore. <laughs> and we're still good friends to this day, but, but uh, I'm like, what? I'm working, I'm being creative. <laughs> and then I had an opportunity to go to the City and Guild College in London and study there for three months. And that's some of the work that I did. And then during that time, I had an opportunity to try my hand at stone carving. So they basically gave me this block of stone and I ended up going to a store and I got a, a plastic uh, silk rose, I guess silk rose. And um, I ended up carving that um, in a couple of days. And that ended up um, actually getting me a job. The people I was uh, um, working with there, I got a job working in Malaysia as a stone carver. So they, they looked at it and said, oh, do you wanna to go to Malaysia and become a stone carver? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? So, don't say no to any of these opportunities. And so that is what I did in Malaysia. And we basically decorated uh, this extremely wealthy man's house with a bunch of corbels and all sorts of things. Yeah, so I was working there with about 10 other English stonemasons. And so I kind of learned on the job, but um, the the wood carving and the stone carving, there's so many parallels with design and architecture and that type of thing. The, the actual design itself is very similar. I just had to learn how to Thank you. carve stone. <laughs> um, so I was there for six months. Um, okay, so uh, th these are some of the pieces that I've carved um, as I moved down. I was living in Minneapolis and I moved down to South Carolina uh, just to get away from the snow. <laughs> and 
And these are some of the um, details. This is actually in my house. I ended up carving the details for uh, two of these and then um, ended up, um, the, the person who built them, built two, and I carved the details for both of them and he got one and I got one. So I still actually have this in my house. <laughs> very, very few times do I actually get to keep my carvings. <laughs> And this is um, another similar Goddard Townsend chest of drawers. So a lot of the period furniture, um, uh, the reproductions, that became a really big thing. If you're familiar with the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, um, is there a guild here at all? No, okay. I know there's one in, in California, but it's more of a Eastern East Coast thing, the, the period furniture, ball and claw feet, that type of thing. And this one, actually, one of the originals sold for $11 million at auction recently. Isn't that crazy? And, and very um, uh, common thing that I do is the Charleston rice beds. These are the just the beds that um, uh, have basically, a, I don't know if I have a full length. No, I don't. Um, but that's basically, it's very typical um, Southern Charleston rice beds where you get the rice um, pattern on. And uh, there's about 10 different designs that you see out there. <clears throat> and then the Queen Anne chair. Again, these are a lot of the period furniture, uh, Philadelphia, Charleston, New York, that type of thing. And Queen Anne, hi boy. And uh, this is something I get, have a, a lot in Charleston is the architectural details, the ionic capitals. Um, the One of my claim to fame is a stage capital for the Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Uh, I ended up, when I was over in England, I got to uh, help carve the stage capitals. And uh, so has anybody been over there to see a, yeah. The, uh, uh, so if you stand there, you look up at the, gold leaf one. <laughs> I help carve them. And some restoration work. This is for a place in Birmingham, Alabama. This is an exterior bracket and you can see there's, I don't know if there's a pointer thing in this or not, but anyway, uh, the one on the right is all cracked and basically water is just completely splitting it. And the one on the left is the restored one. And this is probably one of the biggest projects that I have carved. Uh, this is uh, a restoration of that fireplace. Now this is from a, a 1780s home. And I'll sort of walk you through. So if you look to the left, you see there's sort of this faint design or a, a, a shadow of a design. So these people, which I can't imagine doing that part of the job, but they very painstakingly took layer after layer after layer of paint off one at a time so they could see if they could identify anything that was glued on. And they finally located that. And then, uh, so that's sort of the pattern of that S scroll. And then we also went around to several houses that were within a few blocks of that. And we uh, located some that are very similar, so probably even by the same carver. So there was nothing else on the fireplace. It was a completely plain car fireplace, but we just sort of took these little hints and clues from neighboring fireplaces and that, and that's where we came up with the design there and, and carved that. And so it was quite an adventure. It was about a year and a half long process of discovery, and but I, I just can't imagine doing that taking layer after layer off. I've got patience for carving, but not for that. <laughs> and so this is some of the details of the fireplace. Uh, and yes, it was carved in mahogany and it was painted. <laughs> I was kind of hoping, cause I chose the wood because it was really good solid um, uh, mahogany. But I was kind of hoping that once I carved it then they would look at it and say, oh, maybe we shouldn't paint it after all, but they did. <laughs> And this is a fireplace, and this is how I met my husband. And I had carved this, 
and it was actually setting in the workshop that was going to they were going to be installing it and my husband happened to be looking for some wood that they happen to have and he walked in and said oh who carved that i want to marry her no it's <laughs> <laughs> a little shortened story <laughs> but six months later we were married so yeah there you go almost like that Okay, and this is something we just recently finished. Um, if you look at that, um, the top, um, that's my husband, Stephen. And so what I did was I carved a quarter of these capitals, all right? So I carved a quarter of it and then made a big rubber mold of it. And I wonder if I've got that picture. Hold on. Did I? No, I don't. Um, I wish I wish I had that, but basically, um, my husband discovered this thing. Basically, it, it was a rotary mold. It's all this is. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, <I was> okay. <laughs> okay. So the um, that's a finished piece, and that's all resin. <laughs> so you take a quarter of this capital, and you basically plug. You pour resin in it, and it's a four-minute resin that um, uh, cures in four minutes. So you pour the resin in, liquid resin in, and you do this rotation. And he used a a fishing, a deep sea fishing seat that had a gimbal on it. All right, if any of you was familiar with that, so you got the gimbal thing happening. So you tipped it up, and he's basically has this rotation, and he's going like this, and like this and like this and basically for a continuous four minutes twisting this thing so that the entire inside of this rubber mold is completely covered with the plastic and we did that four more times to thicken it up and each one then has that uh, a quarter capital and then you just build it up with quarter capital so because they needed 35 capitals it would have taken years to carve it and uh, it would have been ridiculously expensive. Uh, the resin itself is pretty expensive anyway. But um, yeah, that just finished. We just finished that in December. And it took us all in all, I think about two months versus, I don't know, <laughs> how many years, three or four years. Any questions? Yeah. So, yeah. so you carve the positive at one quarter. Exactly. Okay, yep. and then you create a resin. A, a rubber mold. mold. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then did you pour in that and create another? Well, you had to create a negative at some point, right? For the other side. Or no, it was it was symmetric. It was symmetrical. It is four four corners. Not not this one. Don't look at that one. This one is is perfectly symmetrical, four corners. Yeah, this one is a little different. That right. one down there. But that one is every corner. So you could do four and they would all all match. But you had to make the the original really, yeah. Um, I have a question from our Zoom audience. Could you repeat the questions when we sorry. Sure. Yep, I'll try to remember that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so so the question basically was how to do the reverse side, but it really isn't necessary to to do that. Every quarter. Is identical and so when you actually carve it you need to make sure see where it joins right where that rosette is you had to make sure that it was really really accurate so that right in that center it would um it would match now those rosettes are added on after the fact those are the only things that were added as a separate design so the the actual um you can kind of see on the one where we're, we're there um where there's a seam all right so yeah but uh it's the, the actual making the original carving really square making sure that because if it was a little bit off then they would never join at that area so anyway it's a uh, interesting you know you you use the modern technologies and they you know look it looks exactly like what um you know it would have been if they were carved in stone or wood or anything like that and they last a lot longer too <laughs> so sometimes that sort of purest side just completely goes out the window <laughs>
And this is a fireplace I did, and that's um, um, cypress, cypress wood. And some kind of interesting, uh, this is real typical Charleston designs on fireplaces. And I like the one on the top. It really creates some very interesting shadows with that, the sort of S serpentine shape. Mary, can mm -hmm. you uh, provide us with uh, what you would estimate the time it took for you to do some of these pieces? Okay, the question was how, how much time would take. Um, let's go back to that one. That one, I think, took about a week to carve. So, and that's full time. Full time, I was pretty much at the bench at least six to eight hours a day. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'd say like the lower one, um, that might take half a day, something like that. I mean, once the thing is when you're when you're carving something like this, the initial one. I mean, if you're doing multiple things, the initial one always takes at least three or four times the, the amount. If you're doing multiple things, then the next one will, it'll be cut in half the amount of time. Because a lot of times when you're carving something for the first time, as you're discovering, you're discovering depth, you're discovering the design a little bit, you know, unless it's something you've carved before. But, um, you know, that, that ends up just taking a lot more time because you're, you're still in that mode of not quite sure where you're headed with it, what the depth is and all of that. So usually the first time of anything ends up taking at least two to three times the amount. Okay, and this is something, this is one of those jobs that really tests your patience. This is wormy cypress and it was about 180 feet of molding going around this kitchen. And so the, the interesting thing about this one is if you look up, do you see how the, the design ends really neatly at the edge? It's not cutting off one of the fans or anything like that. Well, what they did was provided me with all of these lengths, different lengths. And so it was already built in or not built, but it was already, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It was already shaped. <laughs> um, so it, they knew where everything was going. And they gave me these different lengths all the way around 180 feet of it. And I basically had to fit in those um, fans to make sure that nothing was cut off at the corners. All right. So I had to face. So between that length and the one next to it and the one next to it, the width of that fan varied between four and six inches. So some of it was quite wide because you had to really sort of space it out evenly. And so it wasn't like this sort of stamped out thing. <laughs> Every length was, uh, was already, you know, had to be customized. So it wasn't like this thing that I could, you know, have a, have it all nicely, um, nicely patterned out. So everything had to be drawn on separately. Uh, which created some nice challenges, but it wouldn't have looked right if it was cut off at the corners. It would look like something you got from Lowe's that, you know, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was, uh, I think it took four months to carve all of that. Can you imagine four months of just facing the same design over and over and over? <laughs> Ooh, ouch. Okay, and um, this is something that for a while there, it was, uh, there was a lot of people who are wanting these, these big shell niches uh, that just went into either corner cabinets or wall cabinets. And um, that really is kind of interesting. I, I've never really knew this, but quite often, you know, looking straight on, it is a half round. But if you go into the, into the niche, it's usually an ellipse which really messes with any kind of math of uh, laying it out, okay? So, I mean, it would be ideal if it was just a, a half round in and a half round um, uh, from the face, but the ellipse, so basically looking at this one here, basically the ellipse is, uh, is going in. And so if you look at the design of uh, on the upper right, that's how we ended up getting that. And it was this mathematical way of, you know, you get this ellipse 
all right, shape down there. And then you get these layers of wood and you, you need to be really, really precise of how you're actually gonna be cutting those. And if you get it right, it works perfectly. If you don't, <laughs> you get a very strange shaped ellipse. And so that is the ellipse shape. But if you look at that, if I just go and what I did was ground down each one of those corners down to that line, just took a, like an angle grinder, ground it down to that corner. And it basically, you create this perfect bowl shape as long as you don't go past that inside corner because that's what identifies where the shape is. So, you, so uh, all of the cuts that you make need to be really, really accurate with the bandsaw and everything glued up perfectly to the point where you end up just simply removing those corners and then you get this bowl and it worked. It really worked, yeah. One thing that it really sticking out to me is the, the knot right at the top. <laughs> Okay, he's he's talking about the knot that's at the very top. Um, very patiently. <laughs> uh, you you can get past it, and the thing is too, um, there are things you can get away with, especially if it's painted. And most of these are painted. All right, so if there ends up being this really gnarly thing um, that is either you know creating a a, a rough area. You can always put some type of filler putty, um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's uh, you can you can do that. But uh, yeah, it's amazing what how forgiving painted carvings are. <laughs> okay, this is a railing that I recently did, and I'll tell you what: has anybody ever made railings that? you know, this, this sweeping, it's, um, now I didn't actually prepare the wood. My brother-in-law, he was the genius behind that of actually uh, getting the, the wood positioned because that would be the hardest part. I mean, but I probably sat there for a month and, you know, between carving and sanding, basically sat there like that and just almost closed my eyes and went like this down. <laughs> to see if there was any little bump. If there's a bump, I stop, carve that. And I would just be doing that thing. <laughs> I did that for probably a month just to, because the whole thing is um, this, there's two of these and they're flanked like this, right? So if somebody's walking up this and you can feel a bump, it would really bother me <laughs> or it just didn't quite have that sweep. <laughs> you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, Okay, and then um, uh, occasionally I do faces, sculptures. I don't have an opportunity to do this very much, but this is actually one of my own designs that um, um, a friend of mine gave me this beautiful piece of mahogany that was basically out of a, a barn beam, had no idea what the quality of the wood was. It was all rough and, and it gave us this beautiful piece to me. It's about this big, that big. And uh, it looked kind of nasty. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to get when I cut into it. But I started cutting into it. And uh, I had this idea of a woman and very sort of peaceful face and a lot of hair. And I, it's, it's called direct carving when you just have a blank and you just carve into it without, with, without much of a design to it. And uh, it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you end up with a little toothpick at the end of it, <laughs> but but you basically sort of have an idea. And I really enjoyed doing that. I don't get an opportunity to um, do my own designs very much. A lot of times, you know, with period furniture, it's, you know, this very locked in design. So um, it's fun to, to have the opportunity to carve something. And um, <clears throat> tell you what, when you're carving faces, carving closed eyes are much easier than carving opened eyes. <laughs> so, um, but I, I remember I was working on this one and I ended up, um, I was uh, having a, a frustration with the eyes. I just couldn't figure out what was going on with the eyes. So I uh, took a break and I ended up going to the bank and I ended up, um, um, looking at the lady behind uh, at the teller and I, I 
looked at her. She's about maybe 26, 27 years old. And I thought, oh, that's it. I had this eureka moment at the bank. <laughs> I was looking at her eyes like, that's what I'm missing. And um, so anyway, I'm sure she probably was a little concerned that I was just staring at her. <laughs> and probably called security. <clears throat> But you can see the bottom one um, with all, that's all the wood shavings of every single one of those is a chisel cut <laughs> all of those wood shavings on the boxes and uh, kind of amazing when you stack them all in boxes you're like my goodness that's a lot of work. Uh, but that was before it was finished and after I put uh, just a little bit of shellac on it and she really darkened up nicely with that. <clears throat> and this is a. Um, the Mepkin Abbey, there's a abbey in Charleston and they commissioned me to carve this. Now this is interesting wood. This is Polonia. Has anybody ever worked with Polonia? It's a, it's a, it's almost like balsa wood. You, literally, so Joseph is about up to here, right? And I can literally pick him up with one arm. <laughs> so it's really interesting wood. Um, not nice to carve at all if you've ever i mean you would think maybe balsa wood would be a nice wood to carve because it's so soft if you have really if you have if you have sharp tools it's still hard to carve um and uh just because it kind of crushes more than carves and also if you don't have um really good um if you Actually, uh, yeah, it, it will actually dull your chisels because there's the silica in it. And so when I was working on this, it uh, ended up, I have to, had to have a carving machine next to me so that I had to touch it up about every five minutes. And it was this sort of weird silica. So I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> and um, so this is a stone carving that I did just, I was out in Colorado and I picked up this piece of alabaster, really beautiful piece of alabaster. And I uh, took it up to a, um, a cabin that my family has up in Colorado and I was all by myself. And I basically carved this over three days. And uh, this was about six months before I met my husband. And I think it kind of looks like him. <laughs> <laughs> I should actually put a parallel of the photograph of <laughs> who knows it was faint. And this is something that I did uh, during COVID. I ended up doing a, a daily live stream just to keep myself sane and hopefully <laughs> help other people stay sane too. And so I carved her every single day. So the, the, the one, um, the stone one, if you can see the marble one, that was a project actually that I fixed her nose on. She had fallen forward and her nose was broken. So I took a little piece of marble and I repaired the nose. And while I was doing that, I thought she is absolutely gorgeous. I think she's an Italian um, marble a sculpture. Uh, and um, so I thought, you know, it'd be really fun to just have that for a couple months. So I asked my customer if I could keep her for a few months and, and copy her. Uh, and so I ended up uh, carving her in wood over the live stream. And, and it was really, it was, it was nice because you actually had an original to look at and refer to. Sometimes, you know, you have no idea where you're going with things, but if you have something where you can actually physically measure and kind of get, now they don't look exactly the same. She's, uh, um, there's, there's that sort of classical, she's got more of that classical look. Um, I'm not sure what mine looks like. <laughs> okay, and then you're asking about stone carving. Uh, this is a slate gravestone. Um, so if you look up at the top, uh, it was, I was commissioned to do three of them. What's really curious is the one on the left, William Ward, he is, he's the one that commissioned me to do this for his wife and his mother-in-law. And, um, He's just recently asked me to finish his, I'm like, but I don't quite know what date to put on it. So he just, he threw out a random date that I'm just going to put on it because <laughs> he wants to sort of like clean it up, you know, like, you know, get his affairs in order. I'm like, yeah, but 
what's the future, you know, the, the um, you know, ancestry.com is going to really get confused when they see this sort of random date. So he's, he picked out a date about four years in advance and they delivered it to my workshop and I'm supposed to carve in this, the, the blank, you know, there's an empty spot underneath there. So I'm putting a random date in there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what are you planning on doing on that day? <laughs> She's weird. But anyway, I guess he's, he's wanting to sort of tidy things up so people don't have to worry about it. <laughs> anyway, so, but slate is an interesting stone to garb because it's actually has layers. It's almost like, um, like phyllo pastry, <laughs> you know, and in, in a way it's actually very similar to wood because you actually have grain to deal with. Um, but if you look at <clears throat> like the background when you're having to lower a very large space of background, the, the technique was really interesting, but also a little nerve wracking where you basically outline it with a cut, right? So let's say like the background where you see the, 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 the weeping cherub right there, okay? <clears throat> um, you outline it with a deep cut all the way along. So you have this fully outlined thing and then you take one hit. And as long as that's a nice straight grain, it'll come off in, in one big plate. Yeah, but uh, I mean, you, you kind of have to be confident that it's not gonna, you know, like like wood can do that sometimes, it can sort of dive on you. But um, yeah, so it was really interesting. If, if you learn that sort of technique of letting the grain kind of carry it, <clears throat> but it's, it is scary because <laughs> you like make this one solid hit and this big, you know, eight or nine inch plate of, of uh, stone comes off. And uh, these are some other uh, memorial stones that I've done in marble. And the biggest piece I ever did was this limestone fountain, eight foot tall and huge thing, just ground away at it and yeah. And that's the moving day, which was terrifying. So it was all, it was in four different pieces. And uh, I don't, I, I couldn't figure out how many tons this was, but I would say, I mean, I really have no idea. I, it, but yeah, that's limestone. And it was, you can imagine how heavy that was. And that is it finished. Uh, what was fascinating about this is, you know, when you weren't working on this for an entire year um, and seeing, you know, that you're trying to create motion, like I was telling you about with the flames, trying to create motion in this very, very solid material. So all the twirling and swirling waves and everything like that. So try to get give that as much as much movement as possible, just from the design. But what really surprised me, and I sh it shouldn't have surprised me because I mean, that's why I was sort of doing this as a fountain. Once the water started flowing on it, all the waves started moving and it was like just gave me shivers I like oh wow <laughs> sort of, and so and that's exactly what happened so unfortunately I don't have a video of it but um, when the actual water sort of flowed over and uh, dripped on that it's uh, uh, it was pretty it, it worked <laughs> okay then I was happily living my hermit lifestyle carving my workshop and I was dragged into the classroom to teach, <laughs> kicking and screaming. <laughs> and it's true. I would have just been perfectly happy. And then just, you know, somebody says, hey, you want to teach how to carve the ball and claw foot to 25 uh, Texas woodcarvers? So they took me down to Houston, Texas, and uh, I taught 25 people how to carve a ball and claw foot. And I never looked back. So I discovered that teaching is very gratifying when you can actually see the results and see people sort of getting past that sort of that fear, that awkwardness of, of the carving. So as um, I could have just sort of stayed and uh, in a <laughs> become stayed a hermit, uh, but that was what fifteen years ago probably, and so I do have done uh, about a teaching a class about once a month ever since then so it's uh, really really exciting to see uh what people have done some have gone on to 
uh, do this as a career, which is pretty exciting to see. And uh, oops. And these are just various places, um, various. And so you get some people that are quite young, some older retired people, um, just a, a range of people who just, and some people want to do it for furniture, some people just want to carve for fun. And so it's fun to, to see. And the uh, young man up in the upper left with uh, tattooed arms, he actually is, uh, he wants to do it as a career. So he's in Charleston. And this is just a fun photograph. I, had, I teach a class on carving the green man. And isn't it wonderful to see all the different expressions? <laughs> I love the one in the upper left. I mean, the far upper left is so those eyes. Every time I walk by, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> it's frightening. But, um, you know, you see just the different, very, very subtle things. The one in the middle, the middle row to the left looks kind of like Nicolas Cage. <laughs> but it's it's just fun to and these are this is a beginning class too so a three-day class and then they start uh started them out with a donut and carved a green man <laughs> and uh the young man in the upper left is also going to be uh he's wanting to do this as a career and the lower left, he actually teaches at Port Townsend School. So he was taking the class to potentially teach there. And so this, this is uh, some of the projects that I have for my online school. Um, if you're familiar with the, the school, it's been going on now 11 years almost. And a video every single week actually now it's every other week because i'm doing live streaming instead of actual uh, edited videos which is always a little daunting but i'll tell you what doing the live stream during covid kind of got me over the fear of live stream you know like oh as soon as you make a mistake on live <laughs> on live tv it's it's out there <laughs> Question. yes how is just a first from a few perspective how is it to learn with having online Person. Um, I mean, obviously, in person is ideal because you have this immediate feedback. You know, if you're going in the wrong direction, you can sort of be steered back. Um, the um, the online is good because you can you can you know watch a video and you can rewind it and watch it over and over and over and over again. Um, I mean, it goes through all the tools. It goes through. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's it's not ideal but it's something that you can actually see motion. Um, you know, you're, uh, so you've got your book, <laughs> which isn't ideal uh, because of the movement that you need to see, all right? So uh, you, can, you can sort of do step-by-step -step projects, but um, you know, you're missing the whole, how do you do that subtle movement? The video shows that subtle movement and then you can always, you know, rewind and watch it over and over again. Uh, but ideal is is like this, you know, where you actually have it in your hand, and and then you th that with that way you're not necessarily, you know, you might be going down a, a wrong direction, but you can get steered back pretty quickly. <laughs> so yeah. Sorry, I forgot to repeat that question. <laughs> the question is is how is how is the uh, online video. Uh, the video uh, lessons um, are they are they good enough to learn carving? So okay, and then I speaking about the book. I have my carving the acanthus leaf book now. Question: um, Be honest, how many of you have never heard the word acanthus leaf? Yeah, there's usually about half, half the room, which is funny because I'm like, I picked the most obscure topic to <laughs> teach on. <laughs> Nobody's ever, that means that I have to write the book to educate people about this beautiful leaf. But it is actually the traditional leaf that you see everywhere. Eh, 
maybe not so much out here out west but um certainly you know you get the the corinthian capitals and you get that sort of scrolling design what they what they kind of lump it into is that that scrolling leaf work <laughs> you know sometimes you can see it across friezes or uh, in tapestry you, you really do see it everywhere once you once you realize <laughs> that it actually is this leaf that is uh, back um, all the way back from the Greek and Roman times and it's sort of carried through and it actually is a leaf you look if you look at the bottom it actually is a uh, a real leaf and it grows in the Mediterranean and but you can also see that leaf it doesn't look at all <laughs> like any of the carvings um, some of them a little bit more so but it is a very very stylized design that um, you can actually see and what's interesting is I started out with the book thinking oh well I'll, I'll uh, maybe it'll be about six or seven chapters well it ended up being 16 chapters because I kept finding other design uh, <laughs> ideas to oh let's do that one. Oh, let's do that one and uh, yeah, before it was all done, I had 17, uh, 16 chapters. So it grows. And I honestly, I could probably do an entire additional book and, and not run out of designs of this one particular leaf. So surprised me. Oh, and by the way, um, I have sent, sorry, I've ordered a box. Unfortunately, it's going to be a box of books of 10. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's going to get here. Um, it's a three day delivery and probably so Wednesday or Thursday. So if you are interested in them, I did send some up. I just didn't get them organized in time. So if you are interested. Yeah. Okay. And they're, uh, they're $50 a piece. And if you if you want to order them later, they go through Lost Art Press. That's the only place that they sell them. Actually, is there somebody local? No, there's no there's no woodworking store locally that sells. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, so back to that challenge. And so, what is that one thing that you can lose yourself in for hours? And then think of that person that you can kind of guide along. Um, maybe even take to guild meetings um or whatever whatever it is that you're interested in because uh you know if you can bring young people into the guild meetings that's gonna really open up things and um so yes um so maybe even turn that passion or gift into a career who knows and this is my future student this is my grandson <laughs> <laughs> already got the tools out and the uh you know it's got the drill and the saws and actually that the little horse hobby horse is one that I made for him so um but that is my he's now three and a half years old and a an eight month old is coming up little girl so we're uh so that'll be my my future project <laughs> And just some thoughts on how to help keep the traditional arts alive or really any any arts. So help um, young people discover the joy of making, and that means anything. And there's there are um, those program, not programs, there's shows out now that they call them maker shows. Do they have them out here? But basically it's just a combination it tends to be very much based on technology like a lot of robotics but there's also a lot of just hand makers hand builders just people who are doing crafts and doing um uh so if you ever have an opportunity to go to one of these they i think they call them makers shows anyway um they see it seems to be sort of a growing thing for for young people um but that's that might be something also to get involved in um, become a mentor and teach whatever skills you have. Bring young people to the guild or club meetings. Get involved with local historical societies and museums uh, to learn and get learn <clears throat> and get excited about local history. Um, and quite often, museums they have classes that type of thing. Um, discover the many schools that offer programs in the traditional arts. A lot of craft schools, um, like I mentioned, Port Townsend, Washington, a, a woodworking school. 
and just encourage young people to pursue that passion and discover their God-given gift. So, and this is actually, if you have a young person who um, you want to get started and you don't want to give sharp tools to, <laughs> take a, a bar of soap, a bar of ivory soap and uh, make a little turtle. And you just take a, a plastic, um, you know, plastic knife or something like that, and they can just shave it away. And what you do is you stick them in the bathtub at the same time, you know, when you do this, <laughs> and then they can have a bath. <laughs> but it's a, it really is a good way to kind of a good project to get uh, young people interested in working in three dimension. Another thing you can do is you take a, a milk carton and you pour, pour a plaster of Paris in it. And so you get this base block and then you do the same thing there. It's scrape, you basically are using, you can use any kind of tool. You don't have to use sharp tools, but get them involved in that. And, and actually that's for, for the students. You might, I mean, you're talking high school, um, but that might be a good start to sort of um, the actual plaster of Paris thing. Cause then you just take scrapers and um, you know, um, just to get them into doing, working with three dimension. Okay, and of course, my kitty cats, they like to play Scrabble. <laughs> and um, our, this one on the right, the two, he passed away last year, but he's a, he was a sweetie. I'm a crazy cat lady. I have six cats. <laughs> People ask me like, well, what is, the, what is the number you have to own, number of cats you have to own to become the crazy cat lady? And I think maybe six probably have, has probably bypass that. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you want to stretch and sort of like move, move around a bit and uh, I'm going to do some demoing and talk about tools and I don't know if you want to take a little bit of a break and uh, get some coffee. Oh, okay. All right. So I'm just, uh, after this, I'm just going to go over some um, uh, just some demonstrations and talk about tools and talk about sharpening and whatever to learn. And if you have any questions, anything like that? Hmm? Is this the normal mallet you use? It is. It's actually based on a stone carving mallet. It's the same shape of a, as a stone carving mallet, um, but it's very nice. It's about, I think, 15 ounces, something like that, 16 ounces. Um, no, it's more than that. 16 is a pound. It's about a pound and a third. Oh, so, I'm yeah. still anyway. learning them at home. Okay. Well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's irritating. Yeah. That makes some really weird sounds. And I, I know, I notice I've been sort of bumping it too when I ram, ramble on. Swiss <laughs> made. Yes, those are the the file Swiss made. Is there? There's a woodcraft store in town, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they they're the ones that sell those too. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. Yeah, and I'll be talking about the the you know brands and things like that. So. It looks as though you work with tools where your piece is anchored, yes, as opposed to chip carving where someone would like be holding yes plenty. and bleeding. Yeah, <laughs> are there? multiple styles are yes in fact i actually brought some other tools sorry brought some other tools that are um just using different different sizes different and you know, these are the chip carving knives um these are the more whittling knives and then this which is really curious is a it's what they do for spoon <laughs> that's what they do for spoon carving and spoon it it is such a huge thing now greenwood festivals and everybody wants to carve spoons and they have like 500 people coming to these spoon fests <laughs> it's really quite fascinating you know, but uh 
takes you down about three or four inches. So you have to. <laughs> I've heard that. That's, that's the first time people seeing people say to me, "Like, wow, you look you're a lot taller than you look on TV." <laughs> but, uh, I carved. What's the what's this? I think there's a kind of a simple daisy or something that yeah. you start at and mm -hmm. move on to the layered one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really, uh, I carved my wife apart. Uh huh. Plus that flower. For Valentine's Day. Oh, nice. Yes. Ah. The, the heart with my yeah. Brown, brownie points for that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sweet. Nice. Oh, good. You're helping our woman. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Oh, second. The door locked. Yep. Nope. About being tall, and I remember I took your lettering class with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first saw you, and I thought, "Wow, oh, he's really tall." But the times I'd seen you before was on Roy Underhill's show with the so with the benches like raised. He he's probably about six foot two, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I thought, well, that's I'm it's just deceiving, isn't it? Five, <laughs> where'd, the, where'd the cream end up going? Half and half. Yeah. Half and half. There was some. Oh, sorry. Uh, the cream is in the red. Ah, okay. Good idea. Water in the middle. Oh, okay. I'll grab one of those. That just keep it. That more I just enjoy everything. Yeah. Well, like I was talking about, that is the tradition, right? So you erase what was there. And... Here it seems like the um, you know the Native American carving. Um, it seems to be real popular. Um, Port Townsend actually teaches a lot of classes on that, I think, this year. Um, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, traditional carving isn't real popular here. There's there's some of it, but usually it's because they're from <laughs> the oh, East and they moved here. Well, you know, but, uh, all of your fancy cowboys across on the Oregon Trail. Yeah, that's a good point. So. That's a good point. You might have had a lovely you, little you, beer. You from... you you lost half of it along the way. <laughs> for a six pack of Coors in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh, everybody. Oops, settled in. Okay, I think um, at this point, then it's just going to be kind of a combination of. Me rambling. No, no, no more, no more slides. So it's probably. Are you going to be doing mostly demoing the tools and carpet? Yeah, I mean the thing is, so I'll be kind of positioned around here, and so I'll be talking about tools and talking about you know, so any kind of. Oh yeah, I, I guess I keep forgetting I can look at this. So talk about that, and then so it's probably going to be a combination of that one. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so it'll be a combination of. Yeah, that's fine. If I if but if I start rambling on, then <laughs> switch to that one. <laughs> and I I tend to ramble, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to start by talking about some of the materials, some of the the tools that we have um, for the carving. Um, and so just, uh, what I actually use, I've got these, these gloves here. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> this, um, uh, any kind of fingerless gloves. All right. So they definitely don't, um, protect your hands from like cuts from the actual blades, um, but they do protect the sides of your hands. So the style of carving that I do, which is basically all clamped down to the bench and, um, 
and so you're really not ever you know doing the holding a carving in your hand and doing like a, a carving with a short knives or anything like that i have it clamped to the bench and the the main part is of for the gloves is really to protect this side of your hand okay so Ideally, you want to have something that has some pretty good solid leather or something like that that uh, will protect this. Because um, believe it or not, if I am carving a lot, even with the gloves, I can see the sides of the leather shredded. And so we're talking about rubbing really more along the sharp edges of wood rather than the actual tools themselves. So, um, and you know when you look at the leather shredded you got to wonder what your hand would look like <laughs> so especially if you're using working in walnut or something like that or or cherry or something that really can create a very sharp edge uh, that's something that's pretty important and also if you have something that actually can extend a little further down the wrist because this part of my hand is really probably the most uh, where that actually is using being used as a pivot on the wood more often than any other part so if you can have something that will protect that, um, that's going to be very good. And you want on both hands because I basically use, um, I try to go right and left hand. Uh, and that's, I try to use both hands for a lot of things. So you don't do a lot of repetitive work. Um, so you don't have the issue of any kind of repetitive strain injury, anything like that. You go back and forth. And then also as the grain changes as you move around in the design uh it's it, you you can actually access it a lot easier so i'd really encourage you if you do um get into wood carving and this is for the classes that i'm going to be teaching i really stress that to kind of push or or switch hands um from the the most comfortable side and switch hands and kind of force force yourself through that awkwardness because uh Otherwise, you're going to constantly be switching um, your hands and rotating. Yeah, question? Oh, you know what? Not really. I, I get them when they're on sale. <laughs> the question was, is there a specific brand? Um, and it, now, if you go to any sporting stores, um, weightlifting gloves, uh, rowing gloves work. Um, what else? Bicycle gloves, yes. Anything that has the padding. And I think bicycle probably more so because of the vibration and protection of that. Uh, even um, the mechanics gloves quite often have extra padding. So, yeah. It's also protecting some of your palm as well, just a little bit from the pressure and pressure points that you might have to handle. Um, the, the question is, is it protecting the palm of your hand? And I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I suppose it could because let me just show you real quick. When I hold on to the tool, basically it's like this. And so you, you are pressing there. So I suppose it, it probably could. I never really thought about that, but because um, I was thinking more of just protecting sort of from cuts. But um, I mean, there's definitely when you're working on this, it's actually pressing against there. So good point <laughs> but yes yeah, so probably answer to that okay now there are other carving gloves so if you if you know you're going to be carving by actually taking the 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 wood in your hand and maybe using shorter uh, tools or maybe using a whittling knife there are these carving gloves that are actually kevlar gloves it's a little awkward to use um but they really protect your hands so do you guys have any of those here at all or no okay um a lot of times if you're whittling or if you if you're trying to teach a child how to work you just want to like <laughs> cover the hand up with duct tape and all sorts of things um but um yeah that's something that you want to really consider if you're not going to be doing the clamping down and using the two-handed method that i'm going to be showing you chain mail yeah and it, like the chefs use uh, but that would be really hard to hold i would think um but yeah if you're really just more concerned about stabbing yourself and, and bleeding <laughs> um i thought i brought some of them. they they also have this tape you know that stretchy tape uh, so if you're doing a lot of whittling you want to cover up your um thumb if you're doing a lot of whittling and pulling the knife, you basically just cover up your uh, thumb with that tape. And I did a little bit of whittling uh, at the local wood carving club. 
and I wrapped up my thumb and at the end of the day it was so shredded <laughs> I'm like hmm guess that works <laughs> didn't touch my thumb <clears throat> okay um so yeah let's talk about the gloves um the mallets uh this this is really my ideal all right this is something that uh, a friend of mine made <clears throat> and designed really uh, but it's based off of a, a letter carving, stone stone carving mallet, a very similar design. And it weighs about a pound and a third. Um, I would suggest the, the weight of a mallet would be probably no more than a pound and a half and no less than a pound. Okay, anything in between there, and it really depends on how strong you are. Um, but less than a pound, you're kind of forcing it. You're having to use your own muscles to do what um, it, uh, what really the mallet should be doing. Uh, more than that, your arm's just going to get tired. And so what I do, and since I've done stone carving, this is basically you let the, the mallet do the falling rather than, you know, gripping onto it and sort of forcing the mallet to do the work. You actually let the, the mallet fall and, and do the work itself. Uh, now, this one is, it's got a little brass head. Uh, small handle, really nice for doing kind of tight, small work. Uh, and the thing is too, what I like to do with these is hold it uh, like that. And then I can do more tapping like that on little controlled cuts, right? So if you have a turned mallet, uh, turned wood mallet, quite often to get that weight, it has to be quite large. Okay, so uh, if you want to try, you know, turning something smaller, because then you can actually do it, use it like that, and then you can you know, drill a hole in the head of the mallet and put some weight in it, put some metal, you know, something anyway, epoxy, just to weight it, weight the actual head of the mallet, and then you can have a smaller mallet. Uh, there's a couple out there, um, Shenandoah, Shenandoah Toolworks sells mallets that are, um, brass headed and steel headed mallets they've got a longer handle and i think they're about a pound and a half so they're kind of on the high edge um and also um blue spruce tools have you heard of them they've got that uh resin infused mallet and it's really quite nice it's a smaller a little bit bigger than this but it's really really strong um so but yeah, I mean, the wood turned ones work well also, but they're really more for just the heavy, heavy pounding, especially if they're a much larger mallet. Oh, uh, Shenandoah, Shenandoah Tool Works. And um, it's, I don't know how to pronounce that. How do you pronounce Shenandoah? <laughs> but Shenandoah Tool Works, they, they make their own mallets, custom make, and um, a, a couple other different tools, a small company. <clears throat> okay before um so the um the type of of wood that i would recommend starting out with is basswood and we're going to be doing that in this next uh the next class i'm going to be working in basswood it's a light colored wood and you can barely see the green on that and it's really uh just a good one to start out with um beyond that uh, there's another wood that is uh, a good starting wood, which is butternut. Do you have butternut trees out here? No, okay. Because well, it's there's actually um, a. I wonder if I've got a here. Oh, here the the broken one. This is butternut, and it's a really a beautiful grain. If you can see, I don't know if you can see that. A beautiful grain, but very similar hardness to basswood. But unfortunately, there is some type of fungus that's happening with the butternut trees uh, that are basically they're anything that you find now are from fallen trees or they've had to cut them down. But it really um, has some, a little bit more interesting grain uh, than the basswood. Basswood, if you're ever going to be painting it, uh, painting your carvings, then I'd use basswood just because it's not the most interesting grain. <laughs> And uh, so beyond those two really beginner woods, you can move into, once you sort of get the feeling, get the, the technique of using the tools, then you can move to walnut or uh, cherry is, is pretty hard, challenging. 
But again, once you get the techniques down, that's a good one to, to work with. Uh, you're going to use a lot more effort and you can probably use a mallet a lot more. Um, so walnut, cherry, mahogany. But mahogany now is just such a questionable thing of what you're going to get <laughs> because they they lump sapili into mahogany now and it's always very mysterious of what you know what you're going to actually get as carving so uh it's it's not a very reliable wood um sure. and um what else oak you can always use it's uh, again it's kind of challenging now out out here you get the um the cedars which uh, some of them are really nice to carve. Uh, have any of you worked uh, carved in, in any of the local? I don't know what what are the cedars? What's the one? I think you Alaska yellow. Alaska yellow. Yeah, where um, you know you get cedars um, where I'm from, and you get the really hard, soft, hard, soft, or or any of the pines, you just get this really hard, soft, hard, soft. I wouldn't recommend using those. Plus, there's some type of silica in that wood that will dull your chisels really quickly also. Um, I carved southern yellow pine, which is just a nightmare. <laughs> uh, because you, you're literally like carving stone and then like a quarter of an inch away, it's sponge and <laughs> stone sponge. And so when you make cuts going across the grain, you get this nice hill going. <laughs> um, so yeah, not necessarily the best one, even though you think, well, it's it's soft. One of the things, one of the woods that I would stay away from, and people think that it's really a good wood or think that you know it should be a good wood to use is poplar. And it's just it's spongy, it's icky. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and um, because I actually had a chance to work the exact same design on basswood and then poplar. And it was just a bizarre difference. You'd think they're, they 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 kind of have the same look. They have the same feeling of of the the softness of the wood, but it was really it just created this really awkward spongy thing. So I wouldn't recommend working a carving in poplar. Yeah, I'll, I'll hear alder tends to be a pretty good choice. Alder is a good one. Okay, I uh, haven't had an opportunity to carve an alder. Um, it's a very white colored wood, right? Very light colored. Or yeah, okay. Um, I, will, I will say that Kelly Stadelman, who we might have a chance to meet, is one of our most prolific educators. She has almost always standardized on northern white pine. And okay. uh, she does do some basswood, but she sourced it when she could still get it by taking a, a truck up to northern Idaho and getting some finer grain stuff and bringing it back 20 years ago. Okay. I've also found that eastern white pine here is a pretty good alternative for beginners in the sense that you can see the grain like you can see it on basswood, okay. kind of like a butternut. Right. But it still has a little bit of the hard, soft, hard, soft. But I, I think it's a pretty good choice. Okay. Okay. Um, well, maybe we can use some of that. So you're talking about um, what was what did you call it? Um, Eastern, northern white, northern white pine, or eastern white pine? Okay. Um, eastern white be, pine is available locally at cross cut, which is one be of interesting to, to be able to try some of that out if you have some samples of it. Um, you know, I mean, pines typically do have that sort of soft, hard, soft, hard thing. Um, but uh, I don't think anything's as bad as southern yellow pine. <laughs> so, no, I'd like to try it if you have a, a sample of it. Um, Okay, so any other questions about wood? Okay. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk to you about the, the workspaces. Uh, the whole thing about wood carving, especially when you're talking about smaller carvings, you can pretty much work wherever you want, as long as it's a, a comfortable height. Uh, doesn't You don't have to have any of the big fancy workbenches, anything like that. Uh, there are, um, there's a, a kind of an ideal height. Um, I have a regular standard workbench, but I, I put six by six blocks underneath it. Now I'm 5'10", so that gives me um, basically a, a couple inches below elbow is where the work height is. So inch or two, ideally inch or two below elbow 
if you're standing, okay, so if you're going to be standing and carving, and I do recommend that if you're able to stand to carve, it just works a lot better sometimes where if you're kind of needing to kind of redirect and, and put pressure on it. Um, having said that, um, I've had quite a few students who are in wheelchairs or just not able to stand, and we always make it work, uh, whether it is just, you know, adjusting the height, um, sitting on stools. Uh, we've built these platforms that go across the, the wheelchair arms. Uh, the, the only difference is if you're sitting or um, or in a wheelchair, uh, you're, the pressure and the, the um, basically you, uh, leaning into the, the carving is a little bit more difficult. So you're really relying more on your muscles. So, cause quite, quite often what I do is I really kind of lean forward into it. So the pressure and the weight of my body really is doing a lot of the cutting. Uh, so if you're sitting, it just ends up being more of a, of a pressure and, and the effort from your shoulders. So it can be done. It's just different, different um, physical uh, muscles are required. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. The question is, if you're, if you're using that much weight, why not use a mallet? Um, the, um, that's a good question, but a lot of times you're wanting to do that kind of controlled cuts. All right. You're still using, using your weight. Um, and whereas the mallet quite often is more for roughing out. You don't, you, you quite often can't get a really refined surface that way. So, you know, it ends up being more just the, the leverage really is, is uh, easier. Um, so as I was saying, you can pretty much do this wherever. You can do this on your countertop. You can do this on a table. Um, but I wanted to show you a couple ways. Um, now you don't even need to have, I mean, this is a nice bench. It's got bench dogs. I can put whatever I'm carving in between bench dogs. This is what I have in my shop and it works great. Uh, I just, you know, you, you can rotate it if you want. You can reposition it very easily just by clamping and unclamping. But if you don't have that, I wanted to show you another technique. Where is that? Okay. This is actually one of the projects we're gonna be working on next few days. But if you take a look at this, actually, Heidi, can you grab me one of those blanks, please, that you cut out so you can, uh, the cow lily's fine. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So a lot of times you might do something like that. I don't know if it's showing up there. Basically where you want to cut out a design and be able to carve it without necessarily having to clamp the carving itself that gets really awkward when you've got clamps in the way and so what I've done and uh, this is uh, when I first started I used to use a technique of a glue and newspaper you basically hold it down with glue and newspaper um, it gets a little messy because you basically have this glue that um, is or the newspaper that's basically stuck to the back of it but that is one way you can do this and basically hold it to just a temporary backer board and then um, what I've actually discovered recently, probably the last few years, I've started using double-sided tape and it works really well. You basically hold the, the blank down, just put you know maybe two or three pieces of tape along, maybe some extra ones along the real fragile areas and make sure it's held down. Then I just clamp it in, clamp it between the um, uh, bench clamp <laughs> and really tight, all right, so it holds. And then when you're finished, you take a solvent and you just have to find out what solvent works with whatever tape you're using, brush it along the outer edge, and then you can take a very fragile carving, the, the solvent soaks into the tape and you can literally lift it up with, with two fingers. It'll release the stickiness on the tape. Um, the thing is, um, now I use golf grip tape. Any golfers here? Okay, so you're probably familiar with the golf grip tape. Um, by replacing handles, uh, but basically it's very similar to woodworker's tape. I have a feeling it's probably exactly the same thing, but um, 
That'll be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> but it basically has a material kind of masking tape thickness. And uh, the you want to get something that's masking tape thickness. If it's too thin, there's another thing out there that I saw that didn't work very well. It was almost like saran wrap thin. And it's too thin to accommodate for any kind of fluctuations in the surface of the wood and it doesn't hold real tight. So the thicker um, is, is really better for that. And so you can use either one of those methods using the, the newspaper and glue method, a little messier um, or the double-sided tape. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using carpet tape and I know um, it's very easy to find. You just go to Lowe's and you can find all sorts of carpet tape, sometimes really thick. Uh, and uh, it, it works, but have you ever taken up old carpet before? I mean, like, you know, a couple of years old, maybe 10 years old, and it kind of has this crispy, dry, it dries up, all right? So <laughs> it also dries up underneath your carving. <laughs> so if you, don't get back to your carving for a year or two years and then you try to remove it it won't remove it, it just holds and um, I, I made that mistake one time and discovered that and it was a really fragile carving uh, it was actually that that sort of decorative scroll work on that high boy right all very very ornate and uh I tried using a solvent and so, so it would soak under it and it didn't touch it. <laughs> I even tried using like a microwave. I thought heat, heat's got to get, <laughs> get it activated. And it ended up breaking in about 15 pieces. So you just take a flat chisel and pop, pop, pop. So yes, Heidi. Uh, what kind of solvent do I use? It, um, I use uh, lacquer thinner. You can use acetone I believe but you really before you use it before you put your wood on just test it because different tapes might react differently to others so I would suggest testing it um, but uh, yeah that's that's what I end up using and so so that's basically if you're going to be doing something that's cut out like that all right and you, then then what you do is you clamp onto the backer board and your clamps are basically completely free. Your carving is completely free of any clamps. You can rotate if you want. A little bit more awkward to, you know, take a clamp off, take a clamp off, and then rotate it, but it works. And that's actually how I carved for the first probably three years of my carving career before I got an actual real workbench. <laughs> and so also, so this is for if you have something that's cut out like this, but also if you have something uh, that, um, oh here, something like this. Let's say you're gonna be carving something in something like that, all right? You're, and not necessarily anything that's cut out, but you can also take this and put it on a backer board that is about an inch larger. And then even with this one, then you'll have, you can clamp the backer board and completely have this, the space free to carve. Um, it really is a very, very helpful way of doing it. And uh, it, then you have a little bit more freedom because you, can you imagine, I mean, if you're trying to carve something like that, something like that and you have a clamp there plus the clamp is going to damage the carving too and it just gets in the way and you certainly don't want to have your nice sharp tools getting really close to clamps because <laughs> you're going to be denting your carving chisels okay uh, so that's how I do a lot of that now also um, you know I, I have six by six blocks under my workbench if you don't want to do that uh, I mean, these are heavy workbenches. <laughs> Once they're up on six by six blocks uh, or any any raised blocks, you're not going to want to keep changing it when you're doing other kind of woodwork. So there are types of bench um, benches on bench, um, and um, I think you guys have some of them here, right? The uh, ah, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, and they've they've got the the. They're called the Schoberg, S-J-O-B-E-R-G. And I think they run about 250 or 300, but it's a really, really nice workbench 
that you can put on top and it raises it up about five or six inches. It's relatively small. So, you know, if you're carving, you know, sizes like, like this, it works really well. Anything larger, you probably have to get a different process. But um, do you have one of those? No, yeah, okay. You don't have one of those, the Schoberg ones? Do you? No, okay. Um, it's sort of a block of wood. Okay. Formed with ears that can be clamped that's about four inches high, just made out of two by fours, right. glued up into a essentially a block the right height to raise it the way I need it. Nice. To be able to clamp, nice. Have the dog holes to put. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of designs out there. There's you can go online and find all sorts of designs of making your own bench on bench. Um, uh, the the Schoberg ones they call it a workstation, and there's two different kinds. One is a one only raises it up about four inches. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that one. It's a little weaker, a little bit um, the the larger one, the um, the one that raises up more like. I don't remember, five or six inches. Uh, it's a little bit more substantial if you're going to be shopping for one, but there are all sorts of designs out there. I think there's a Veritas one out there where you can actually buy the whole clamping system and this big fancy thing. Probably the, the clamping system itself probably costs more than the entire <laughs> Schoberg one. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got, oh, I'm looking at the benches in this room and some of them are pretty short. So we're, we're going to have to do something in the classes. Um, and um, yeah, we were discussing that there's, you don't have bench risers, so we're going to do the benches, the bench top benches. Yeah, okay. We'll make it work. <laughs> so yeah, ideal height when you're actually physically working, bend your elbow like that and just pretty much go inch or two below. If it's higher than that, um, you're going to have some pretty sore shoulders. And then if you feel like, if you feel like you're having to sort of stand on your tiptoes to, to actually carve, that might be uh, a little high. <laughs> and if you just feel like you're bending too much and leaning your head over too much, then it, it's going to really strain your back. Okay, so with this method of the, doing the gluing up, you can do that anywhere. You can, you know, go out, sit out on a picnic table if you want to carve and, you know, clamp this and then you can have the complete freedom to, to carve. So, all right, any questions about the, just the work holding? Okay, um, I want to go over the carving tools, all right? And just want to show you, now the, the tools that I prefer are these long handled ones, all right? Anything from like nine to 11 inches um, where both hands can comfortably fit without overlapping, all right? Without your hands overlapping. But basically the way to hold it, basically put your thumbs together, all right? So as you're carving, you're basically like this and this is braced against your hand and then pivoting this uh, right on that, really this is like a bone here because it's <laughs> it's actually like a rock and you're basically moving like that now as i said you're i would really encourage you to kind of work through that awkwardness of using the other hand that you're not comfortable with um, i'm very much right-handed so this is very natural to me but i would encourage you right at the very beginning and this is what i do in my first beginner classes first day usually by the end of the first day once you kind of push yourself through that awkwardness usually by the end of the first day of carving it's equal uh, from right to left hand because you're still doing when you're doing this this is basically pushing forward and it's also doing twisting and this one is actually holding it back because your hands up against the wood and it's also kind of pulling it and pushing it that way. All right, so you're, they're both doing a lot, even though this is really just the leading hand. So switch and get a feel for that. And so that's basically why I like these. If the, the thing is, it's, it's a lot safer 
Um, first of all, the little palm gouges, which I brought a few of those little palm gouges. <clears throat> oh, did I actually? Did I bring them? Well, here's a little, this is what they call little dockyard tools. It's, um, it is a uh, little micro tool, really handy, really nice tools, but it's really tiny. But the thing is, there's a temptation to use these tools with one hand. And so, you know, your, your other hand's somewhere else, right? <laughs> Possibly on the other side of the blade. So I would say, um, basically leave all body parts this side of the blade, whether it's fingers, <laughs> um, whether, you know, if you're tempted to carve this way towards yourself, stop, think about it, rotate the wood and go the other direction. Uh, so that's the whole thing about when you're using it with um, two hands, basically your hand is, both hands are the side of the blade. The only time I really ever cut myself is maybe if I'm just careless and maybe a tool is kind of sticking off the edge and I might just bump it or when I'm packing them in and out of the tool roll. All right. So you know, then, but the thing is, those are not major cuts. Those are like a little bump of the blade. If you're holding on to something like that and you're really doing some serious pressure like that, you could do some damage. Um, the only time I ever really needed stitches was when I was working that te technique of having the um, glue and newspaper on the back and I was holding on to it and I was just cleaning up the newspaper off the side of it. And I was holding like that and I was using one of these long handle ones. And I was basically doing that and it just, the little voice in my head was saying, you probably shouldn't do this because that's a very sharp tool. <laughs> and I didn't listen to that voice. And it was a really sharp tool too. <laughs> it made a nice clean cut, but I did need stitches on that one. So that's the only time in the 30 some years of, of carving just because, uh, you know, just that technique of keeping everything this side of the blade. So yes, uh, you can do some, you can do some damage because these are some razor, razor sharp tools. All right, now let's uh, just look at some of the close up. Yes, yes. Oh, what do you want to, you want to grab some? I'll just keep talking or, I mean, it's, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want to take a little bit of a break and get some food and go back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you cover a little bit of the sharpening? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to try to fit that in. Uh, are you in the class? Uh, the, you know, class. okay. No. I, I, I can't, I don't have time for that. So yeah, okay. Having no silly lady. I was going to say, because I think two people had to back out. So oh, there's, yeah. I think two. Well, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm living between Vancouver, Washington, and Seattle. Oh, uh, okay. I shop this place in Seattle. Okay. So I'm sort of in part of relocating down here. But okay. I'm not there yet. Okay. So okay. I'm here mostly yesterday and today, and then I'm driving up back tonight. Ah, uh, okay, well, okay. So that's a, you actually have to you actually have to work. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. trying to do this for a living. <laughs> so you do wood carving? I a little bit on furniture. Okay. Yeah, and I want to incorporate more of that into furniture. Okay. Also, and and my 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 father did a lot of wood carving. Okay. Uh, where are you from? Norway. Oh, Norway. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so that's a got, good tradition of. I got uh, these tools. Yeah, nice. So, the old yeah. ones, old tools. These are old, yeah, small tools. Some handmade ones and things. Yeah, or? they are like H. Taylor from England. Yeah. yeah. Henry Henry Taylor. Henry Taylor. Yeah. 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 They they still make them, but the the older ones are much better, better yeah. quality. So yeah. And a lot of the tools he has, or I got from him, he made his own handles. Okay. So, so they have like good size handles. Ah, uh, nice, nice. And yeah. some of these handles, he has sort of like a little bit notch, I guess, like band like them, so they fit more in your palm. And he made Actually, stuff. custom, custom made, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Now I think for me, it's really about, especially about like these ones and how they recommend 
make them mm -hmm. sort of straight and the curve. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, I'll be going over sharpening and uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, your campus. <laughs> it is. It is funny. I, I've noticed um, after I wrote the book how many people had no idea what the campus leaf was. I learned the word from you. Yeah, <laughs> it is funny. I'm like, wow! I just because when you when you study either architecture or traditional design or anything like that, there's they're all over the place. They are, and and once I learned the word, I was seeing. <laughs> like, oh, that's mm -hmm. a pretty. <laughs> yep. I bet they grow well here. Yeah, we have a couple of plants. I don't know if yeah. they're actually campus, but they they look <laughs> yeah. Big monster leaves. Mm -hmm. I have a, a mirror that I'm... Yeah, the pink ones too, you know. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> <can't>. oh, <laughs> Uh, I don't even know where I got these, but they're, I don't, R-E-E -E hut, I don't know, I don't even know what they're made for, I, I found them somewhere, and I get a lot of colors and stuff in, in, in the park, yeah, so I use, can I use gloves, yeah, yeah, it's this part here, if I don't use gloves, this gets really, really worn, yeah. just along the side, and I, so I, I still have a, quite a callus on the side there, I tend to not use gloves a lot only when i just when i think about it and i actually start hurting <laughs> so it's like i don't know if it's part of me that sort of wants to build a callus so it's sort of more of a protecting mm -hmm. um i don't know i guess it, it's probably more like see i used more gloves in the beginning when i'm doing more material yeah yeah the heavier i want to have more feeling right well, and that's why I like the fingerless gloves because you can actually still touch yeah. touch the wood and see. Yeah. Well, you have some time. <laughs> I'm making a replacement ornament or trying to for a mirror uh -huh. because I bought it and the ornament was broken. Right. Which is why I bought the mirror. And I didn't do any research. I just sort of used that as my pattern, zipped it out of a bandsaw drew sort of a picture and went to town and so I'm going to have to like I'm going to keep working on that but yeah. I'm make another blank and then you know, bring it in and say so you well, to bring it in uh, if you want to come in during the advanced yeah, the, class the curving. yeah yeah, That's yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's good to be more mindful of the work it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> you want me to grab some for you or do you want to um that's fine i'll, I'll probably just wait okay. it, they're going to be yeah yeah it's fine i don't need any right now <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess to be quite large, yeah. It's nice though to have it all in one because I've got some that are 
smaller. <laughs> yeah, I actually had one of my mallets confiscated because I forgot I put it in my carry on and they take it out and they're like, this looks like a blunt object. I'm like, it's a wood carving mallet. Try to sound, sound as innocent as possible. It's just a wood carving mallet. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they took it though. They actually, they actually took it and and I didn't, I was, I was running late, so I couldn't go back and do the mailing off or checking it or anything like that. So, yeah. So I lost my favorite mallet. No, no, it was long, probably on, it was probably on eBay somewhere. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it's a shame. But yes, they said, no, it looks like a blunt object. Like it was just one of those last minute things that I was packing up and I just slipped it in my carry-on. Didn't didn't think about it. <clears throat> uh that's a good question. I don't have to aim it. So when you think about uh you basically holding out like that and I'm looking at the blade rather than having to look at that to make sure that it's squared against it this way however it fit, hits will work so that's my theory anyway <laughs> what's that yeah if you're doing it like light tapping I mean you could do it like that also like that but um you know i'm i'm focusing on that for if if it was square you have to actually really do a little bit more focusing on making sure it hits square so but having said that stone carving they do a lot with the square so i think it's but these are just easier for that way every once in a while you do see stone carving mallets that are have a square head on it All right, should I continue on? Am I still doing the Zoom thing? Is that still active? Okay, right, okay, just wanna make sure. Um, okay, I wanted to go over tools and how they're identified. And then I'm gonna also gonna go over sharpening. So we'll be packing a lot in. Um, and so I wanna start by explaining, can we um, do, um, Maybe close up because I'll be doing sort of some drawing. Maybe even that one there. I'll I won't get in the way. There we go. Okay, so tools are identified by two numbers. And so if you look at this, basically this the Swiss made or file, um, very convenient in that the numbers are actually on the um, actual handles. All right, so this one says five F dash fourteen. All right, so. I'll explain what all that is. The F stands for fishtail as it flares out, all right? And I really would recommend those uh, when you can find them as fishtail. They just, they end up being the sort of nice skew chisel almost that will really fit into corners. Um, and so once you start using fishtails, I don't think you'll ever go back to the straight ones. So straight ones are like this, all right? So basically the whole, the the metal, basically straight from there all the way to the tip. And then the fish tails, uh, or they also call them fan tails. Uh, they're usually, the, the fish tails are a little bit more expensive usually, which is curious because there's less metal, but <laughs> maybe it's just <laughs> the shaping part of it. Um, but that, uh, um, these are really my preferred ones, the fish tails. Okay, so let's go back to that. So basically it's identified, the tools are identified by two numbers. The first is the sweep or curvature, and the second number is the width in millimeters. Okay, so start out with a number one, which is a flat chisel. Is that going to show up? Not really going to show. Oh, you know what? I saw a sharpie around here somewhere. Here we go. Let's 
do that. I've got one. Yep. Yeah, that's going to show up much better. Okay, so number one, flat chisel, right? So it's different than a bench chisel. Uh, it's much easier to carve with a flat number one wood carving chisel than a bench chisel. The angle is uh, is much larger on a bench chisel. Oops, open that. All right, then number two, very, very slight curve. It's like probably too much of a curve, but very slight curve. And this number twos are really good for doing backgrounding, removing and smoothing background so that the corners don't dig in. If you tried to use a number one or flat chisel for lowering and, and leveling off a background, the corners will probably dig in. So twos are really good for that. And then we go on to number three, just a little bit more curved. Number four, a little bit more, okay. All the way, each one gets a little bit more curved all the way to a number 10, which is a half round that all right so we're talking about then that's the first number second number then represents the width from corner to corner a straight line across right so from there to there there to there in millimeters okay so let's just show what's going on with this <clears throat> here's one that is a number two 20 millimeters all right it's a straight one and number two, as I said, is almost flat, right? It's just a slight curve to it. So number two, 20 millimeters wide, all right? And um, then if it goes, there's a couple other ones, number 11, which is actually a U shape. It's got a flat wall, got a curve, and then a flat wall, a little, a little bit more even than I drew it. <laughs> so, and, that is also the really tiny ones are also referred to as veiners. And that's what you make veins with, vein lines with. Let me show you. This is a really good. So do you see all the lines there? The really, really tiny ones. Then they get as small as a half millimeter, tiny micro carving tools. But a lot of times they're used for making the vein lines in traditional leaves. Um, then as they get, as this, Number 11 gets larger, they also call it a fluter. So we're talking about, you know, three or four millimeters and higher to make flutes in, you know, if you've seen columns with the, um, the flutes going up. And because these have got long or tall walls, they clear the wood and make this nice groove. And it works really well with that. And then the next one, which I tend to, use quite often is a number 12 and that is a v chisel and that is also the number 12 is the 60 degree angle they change there's thir a number 13 and a number 14 which change the angle of the v chisel i wouldn't necessarily recommend doing anything other than a 60 degree v chisel i i have probably 10 v chisels or more but they're all 60 degree angles. They have they come in 90 degrees, 90 degrees, which is really awkward to use. It doesn't get the depth that is necessary. And then there's also, I think 45, something like that. Anyway, it gets really thin. Um, and those, and I'm gonna show you how to sharpen them, but those are really, really hard to sharpen because um, the stone that you need to use in get into a 45 degree one is really hard to have uh, and actually create the stone. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about that in a minute, but um, it's so just the sharpening process of a really, really tight angle like that is, is much more challenging. Okay. <clears throat> and I want to show you, oh, it's soaking all the way through. Um, so when you are shopping for carving gouges, you quite often see this chart like this. Have you seen this? All right. And all those represent a particular number sweep. All right. So let's just say that is a number seven. 
right? Number seven sweep, but these are the different widths. Okay, if you can see, do you see how basically if you take this tool, a really narrow one, and then make a cut at the same time or at the same place as a same sweep, but a larger one, they're not gonna be the same curve, right? Because of, of the way that they've formed these. So it gets a little complicated. So the, the way that they do this, basically, if you, sorry, the way that they get the, the actual numbers, have a series of concentric circles, and then you basically get an angle, let's say from there to there, everything within there is, let's say a number seven, all right? So you see it's a lot tighter of a curve for the narrower ones than the large open ones, all right? So let's say even from this line to, let's say from there to there, everything from there to there is, let's say number three, okay? So they don't always really, or they don't match up with the, the different widths. Okay, so keep that in mind. But what's interesting about this is the result of that, you can actually take a, Let's just use number sevens, okay? Because it's sort of the mid-size one. Um, but you, if you take a two millimeter and you make a cut, and then if you take a four millimeter, take the next size up. I'm just going uh, even numbers just to skip through. And then you take a four millimeter, next size up, and then a six millimeter, and then an eight millimeter. You will have a perfect expanding Fibonacci spiral. If you use all of that same number and then just, you know, continue all the way up. So I don't know if they did this because this is a very typical um, uh, architectural design, traditional design, that volute or that scroll. Uh, I don't know if they made the numbers that way in particular, but it certainly is a result of doing that and using all the numbers um, so the difficulty is I've got a lot of different brands and they don't always <laughs> work precisely. If you have all of, let's say the Swiss made or file, all of number sevens that go all the way up to, you know, 30 millimeters, it will give you that really perfect spiral if you continue on. So anyway, kind of a neat um, result of that. Um, now I wanted to just show you a really, uh, really the basic set of tools. And I don't remember if, I have a question. if Can you, you wanted hear me? to just start out. Um, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> um, okay, if you wanted to start out just with a basic set of you know, five or six tools that um, typically they end up running, you know, if you want to get really good quality tools, they end up running between 30 and probably $45 a piece. If you want to get the really good and, and actually have them sharp when you purchase them. So the Swiss made or file, there's a woodcraft store in town, right? So you can usually access that. They've had a, a tough time keeping supplies in though or getting supplies. So um, there's also chippingaway.com. It's a Canadian company and, um, they actually have a set of tools and I'll, I'll list that. And um, uh, they're pretty good to work with also if you can't find them locally. But um, so what I'm gonna do is just, uh, so I recommend getting a V chisel. So a six millimeter V chisel. And again, that 60 degree angle, okay. And then a number three, six millimeter. All right, which is a nice small one, but it's a number three slightly curved. And then I go number three, 14 millimeter. And then number five, six millimeter. Number five, 14 millimeter. All right, so these are just, I'm, I'm taking odd numbers, number threes, number fives, and then I'm gonna go number seven, same thing, number seven, 14 millimeters. Just to keep it simple, basically it's threes, fives, and sevens. I don't know if you can see that here. So threes, fives, and sevens, and then 
six millimeter and 14 millimeter. Now the actual set that is um, quite often a beginner set, I eliminate the five, six, um, just to sort of keep it down because it can end up getting quite expensive if you just keep adding on things. So I've taken out that one. So basically the, the beginner set is, is that set. Um, but just to keep it simple, basically six millimeter, 14, six millimeter, 14 of each one of those. And then if you want to add in more, then I would suggest maybe something a little bit larger than a number seven for just taking out a bunch of wood, uh, maybe like a number eight or a number nine that's really curved that, you know, if you just want to hog out a lot of wood. Um, and then you can start filling in. So between the six and the 14, maybe a 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter. All right, so you can kind of fill it in. But this is a really good, you can do a lot of carving with a set like this. Yes. Is number nine more useful for getting rid of wood than, the, say, the number two? Um, is the number nine more useful for getting rid of wood than a two? And yes, because of the curvature, you're actually gouging a very large amount out. Number two, um, it really isn't removing a, a huge amount of wood. So let's say, yeah, let me show you. So, so we're talking about this, this, uh, it's a little hard to see that, but that curvature, right? You're really scooping out a bunch of wood. Uh, so yes, it's, you're, you're, you, with each cut, you're actually able to remove a lot more. So if you're really trying to um, just, remove volumes maybe like a number nine you know 14 millimeter or even larger sometimes you want to get something quite large <clears throat> so that's a good start um, i want to talk about the the tool brands also so we're talking about the one that is really the most available is the file or swiss made all right because you can actually walk into a store and you can walk into Woodcraft and look at it and shop for it. Very few of the other brands uh, allow you to do that. Uh, and, um, and it seems like they have the most ranges available these days. Uh, there's a couple other ones. I just wanted to list some of them. So there's Two Cherries, Hirsch, and Dastra. All right, those are German tools. And I believe through the years, they've sort of melded and become one company. Adastra, 180 year old company, was just closed down a couple of years ago. I believe they were bought out. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, what has happened with that, but those are all really good quality tools. Um, you can find, let's see, Diefenbacher Tools sells two different ones, I think, of those. Uh, the, the Hirsch, sorry, Two Cherry and Dastra. I think Lee Valley sells Hirsch. Uh, so anyway, there's you can find online um, where these are, are sold. Uh, generally, they come sharp. Okay, so this what's nice about the Swiss made also, um, the, the file, they do come razor sharp. So, which is really great when you have like a two day class and everybody gets brand new tools rather than spending, you know, two days sharpening, which could certainly happen. You can actually start immediately with them. Uh, but some of the less expensive ones, um, they, you end up having to sharpen them. So we've got the file, which is Swiss. The two cherries, Hirsch and Dastra, which are German. Stubai is Austrian. That's another one. And um, here I can write these down too if you want, just so you can get an idea. <clears throat> so we've got file or also Swiss made. Swiss made. Mm -hmm. company, you don't know, but the company that makes Dastra, cherries. Yeah. Lamp, the Lamp is part of that? Same German company. Okay. And the local supplier here, Woodcrafters, sells the Brack brand. Some of these are bought from them. So from my perspective, Twist Made at Woodcraft or Brack at Woodcrafters are both top top tier uh, brands that we have local. Well, that's, that's very interesting. So you were saying that they're they're all basically just lumped together. 
so lamp is another one that's because I wasn't I wasn't sure lamp is a German Master, one. Mastercard. These are private private branded versions. So Mastercard in Florida has the lamp brand. Yeah, Joe yeah. Reinhardt used yeah. to buy lamp. He yeah. Loves lamp. So I'm going to list that too then. The owner of the local store, big okay. store, local woodcrafters, went to Germany, visited the founder. Okay. And basically says all those tools are coming out of the same place. So all three are Germany. And Dastro, I think, um, there's five, five or six of them coming out of that. So same company. That's very interesting because I was wondering because there's very similarities between the tools and shapes and where the numbers are stamped. Um, uh, interestingly, when you look at some of these, and I'll show you some of them if I even brought them. Oh no. Um, yeah, so this is Dastra, and it's really hard to see, but basically the, the actual numbers are stamped on the metal, so they're a little bit more challenging to see rather than stamped on it, so you kind of have to, you know, look at them. Um, if you, so if you do use any of these, uh, you're, you, it's, it's better idea to actually be familiar with the actual and recognizing them by the blade rather than trying to, like, identifying by the numbers all the time, recognized by the, the actual looking at the blade. Um, I think, uh, you know, with the Swiss made, having them there so available, we're getting spoiled with that. <laughs> okay, so then the English ones are Ashley Isles. Uh, and then Henry Taylor. And I know there's one other one, English one, but I can't remember the name of it. But um, I know, so these are these are both English. There's an an antique English, which is Addis. All right, if you're into antique tools, uh, that's probably the most common one you'd find, Addis and then Addis and Sons. They had four generations of furniture makers. And um, so that's also English. Uh, are you, are you, and I'm not French, so I'm probably butchering the way that that's pronounced, but um, this is actually designed by Chris Pye. They were designed by Chris Pye, who's an English carver, but it's actually a French company. They're having a hard time manufacturing, so it's hard to see, but if you ever can find their fishtail, if you can ever find their fishtail, um, did I bring any of those? They're really, really good quality, but it's so hard to find them. Here's one, I did bring one. So really delicate little tools, but they are strong. They look delicate and um, they're really nice fishtails and they do a nice splay, uh, but um, hard to find. I think Highland Woodworking and Lee Nielsen used to try to sell them. Yeah. Can you address what you're sacrificing if you get a poor quality tool versus what you would get if you get a high quality tool? Okay, talking about uh, poor quality tools versus high quality tools. Um, and I haven't even gotten to the low quality tools yet. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. Um, it's They can be so frustrating, especially, I mean, I, I've taught where... I taught classes, beginning classes, where people brought, you know, a, a 10 set of tools that you can get for $80. And it's just frustrating. First of all, they're not sharp. They're bulky, kind of heavy. Um, and it just ends up being more frustrating than anything. And usually what, it, what I find sad is basically stops people from carving before they start. You know, it's, they'll, they'll you know, if you can't get that, the tool through the wood. Um, there is, yeah, it's, I, I just would recommend investing and, you know, you can get some cheap tools out there. You can go to Harbor Freight and get some, <laughs> get a, <laughs> a couple <of> screwdrivers. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what I would recommend really is just, even if it's like two gouges of the, of the really high quality, just two of them, just so you can see the difference because you can immediately tell the difference between uh, one that you just you know, buy right off the shelf with the Swiss made and then uh, do a side-by-side -side comparison because it's a completely different world. 
and uh, you end up I think you probably end up wasting money you know with if you try to go the the cheaper route um which is you know I'd love to be able to say you know yeah there's, there's a great set of tools and um because a lot of times the the cost of the tools is in, uh stops you from starting too you can like the that set that I listed is probably between 200 and 250 dollars so hard to hard to do that but um Again, I mean, even if it's just maybe getting one gouge that's a really high quality, and once you once you see the difference, it's going to be hard to go back to to that. Um, there's a there's a tool brand out there that is kind of mimicking the Swiss made, and it's a shaft. Have you seen those shaft tools? Uh, they usually end up coming dull. Uh, whenever students have brought them to classes, it's always been a frustrating experience for them. Um, and that's when I uh, loan out uh, just a side-by-side -side comparison between the, the file and, and the shaft. Um, usually they have to be sharpened. Even if you have them sharpen them, there's still just something about them that they're just kind of bulky and not really nicely shaped. Um, there's another one, uh, Master Carver. We're talking about the, the Florida company. The thing is, once you get them sharpened, they're really good with that and shaft also. Once you get them sharpened and get them reshaped to, to really what you're wanting, um, they hold a good edge. It's not that. It's just not being able to have them like that immediately. And so if you're a beginner carver, it can be very frustrating. Um, there's another... Um, this is actually a little bit better, the flex cut. You probably are familiar with those more from the smaller ones, uh, the palm gouges. They are really good quality. The, from anything that I've seen, they hold a good edge, the, but the flex cut, it's exactly what they're called. They flex a little bit. <laughs> so you've got these long handle, they, they're very limited with the numbers that they have on the longer ones, but they flex a little bit. So it's a little disconcerting when you're carving and you have this sort of thing moving on you a little bit. But um, I, I don't know how much are they, 10 or $15 a piece? I, I don't know, but I don't have any myself, but every once in a while, students have those and they're, they're good quality. Um, uh, just a little kind of oddly, oddly feeling. Um, but, you know, I've got all of these tools here and really you could probably get away with you know, if you're wanting to do a lot of different things, you could probably get away with between 10 and 15 tools and be able to pretty much do everything out there. Yes. So the tools that you have there, is that what you got is your only tools that you don't really use? Um, the, okay, the question is, are all these tools here, these are the ones that I normally use. I've actually brought a lot of extra ones for the, the classes that I'm gonna be teaching. So in case people need extra ones. Um, I just sort of bring as, as many as I, as I can. Um, generally though, the actual physical tools that I use in a project are no more than really 15 maximum, um, which is funny because I've got like 400 tools. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't have too many. <laughs> yes, I say that, but no, no, you don't need any more tools. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to just show you um, also some other unique, um, oops, yeah, uh, anyway, let's carry on. Um, if you look down here, okay, now there's some other shapes that you might want to consider. If you're going to be doing a lot of sort of unique carving or deeper carving, uh, there's what's called a spoon bent, all right, do you see basically curved like that? All right, the, the sweep is like this, but you've got the nice bend in it. Now, this is an antique one. I think this might be an Addis. Yeah, this one says RJ Addis cast steel. So uh, that was one that I got as an antique, but really helpful if you're trying to get into areas. And when you think about those, um, the shell niches that I was showing you, the really big shell, I had one of these that was huge to get the hollowing out of all of those shells. Uh, if you didn't have 
a bend in it or a spoon bent. You basically, you would take a straight one, right? It would come down and do that sweeping and you'd get to a point right here where this would hit that upper edge and then you get stuck right there. So the only way to get past that and continue that curve down was to use a spoon bent. So there are some times when it's the only thing that will actually complete the project, uh, but I don't use these very much. I mean, if you if you really have to get into some areas that are really awkward, um, and mainly because a lot of the carving I do is more shallow relief, but if you're doing some really deep carving, it's very necessary. Uh, then also have, it's called the back bend gouge, all right? So if you look at that, so the bevel is on top, it's a curve like this, all right? And then basically, again, it allows you to sort of lift up the tool a little bit and do a convex shape to it. I hardly ever use these tools. They sit very pretty up on my walls <laughs> and my my collection. I've got, I don't know, maybe, maybe a dozen of them, but I've never, uh, I think maybe when once you, you know, you get used to tools or you get used to using particular tools and I, I didn't have those when I first started so maybe I just got used to them so anyway um all right are, any questions on yes on the uh, fishtail versus the string chisel is the fishtail more advantageous why um okay the question is between the fishtail and the straight are they more advantageous advantageous on a wider blade not necessarily there however you do get to a point where they actually i think underneath a six millimeter they don't have fishtails all right so they just don't it just you know there's no room to to have this playing out so underneath the or a, below a six millimeter they don't have them uh they have fishtails all the way up to you know 60 60 millimeters the huge ones so um so i don't know about that whether they're more advantageous i'd say just fishtails are more advantageous across the board period um however i want to just explain that along the same lines the more curved you get like you get into the number eights nines and tens it's not really necessary for the fishtail so that's where you end up not necessarily getting the fishtails because basically the whole point about the fishtail is you're kind of going into corners and if you get a really curved gouge those corners aren't really going to be affected so they don't make them on the low mm -hmm. they don't help on the high on the, the high curve we're talking about we're talking about like the number eights nines and tens curvature so we're talking almost half round um and it's not really necessary it's uh um, they, I think some brands do actually, some of the German ones do have them, but it's not, it's not really necessary. Um, beyond like a number seven, the fish tail will never, the, the corners, um, you know, when you're trying to get and actually get some details and getting the corners into the wood tightly, you, you can't really do that with a very curved gouge anyway. Curved gouges are generally more for doing the hollowing, heavy hollowing of, of things and it's it's not really necessary but so when you're talking about more like from the number threes to the number seven curvature that's where you can really use it and take advantage of the fact that these corners are splaying out and you can kind of reach it into corners so does that does that answer that okay okay i wanted to go over sharpening <clears throat> and now the um, so the techniques that I use basically I use diamond stones. You can use any other stones you have. If you can use Arkansas stones, you can use uh, water stones, whatever you want to use. But you want to um, use a couple different um, different grits. All right, so what I use is I use a 1200 and then I use an 8000, right? So 1200 to start to really just do some, some sort of roughing or really just removing the bulk of the metal if you have to, uh, you know, if you've got a, like a little nick in the edge of the tool. So I start out with a 1200, 
And then I finish and really do the final honing with an 8,000. So whatever tools you use or whatever stones you do use, you just want to make sure that you really refine it. You finish it off with something that will just create that really nice mirror, mirror edge. The diamond stones I've found that are really quite good. Um, I used to use Arkansas stones and they probably have kind of sped my sharpening up. I really cut it, cut the time in half. Um, so it does just do this. It's a nice little clamp. Uh, okay. And the thing is the amount or the, the lubricant that you use, it, you can either use water or Windex is really good. So have you ever seen that movie, the uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? <laughs> Windex is like a cure-all for everything, so even this. <laughs> I love that movie. All right, so a little bit of water, or they recommend a little water with detergent. Oh, um, can I get a napkin, please? I'm going to make a mess here. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so this is where a Sharpie really comes in handy, when you're just kind of getting the feel for how to do this. If you basically do a Sharpie along the back side, have you ever done this technique with flat chisels or planar blades or anything like that? But it, what it does is it kind of gives you clues of making sure that it is set on the stone um, as accurately as possible. All right, so you do that right on the back. And so ideally, what I want to see is it hitting the stone from that heel all the way to the tip, all right? So I want to have all of that black marker go. Typically, though, what happens is it either hits like a high spot uh, and you'll see a little sort of a thin area going away. And if that's the case, then you need to make sure that it's, it goes flat against the stone and you just keep, keep going until the whole thing is flat. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you buy tools quite often they come with a little bit of a secondary bevel on the back so just uh this on here I can... sorry i'm sorry to interrupt i'm just sure. a question what's that it takes us back to our curves and people would like to hear you say one more time about using the rest of chisels to make the spiral the note was if you use the same number of chisels and change the sweep, you get a perfect scroll curve. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. So, okay, let me just go back to that. So, the question was more to explain a little bit more about that um, spiral. All right. I guess I can probably, since you're already up there. Well, yeah. Either one. Okay. All right. Let me just get back onto that one. All right, so the question was to clarify that a little bit um, with this. So basically, yes, if you take all, but it needs to be the, the same number, like for instance, number seven, I'll do it again. So basically you take a two millimeter and then you connect with a four millimeter and then you take, an, and take a six millimeter and just connect each of those cuts. And if you take the next one up, eight millimeter, 10 millimeter, basically the, those will create, but it needs to be that same uh, same number uh, gouge. So sevens, fives, um, obviously that's going to depend on how tight that, that scroll is. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, what was I? Um, so basically the... Um, Quite often when you buy tools, you have the, the inside and then you've got a little bit of a secondary bevel on there. And I think it's probably just because they, um, it's easy <laughs> to sharpen them and you get them when you take them home, they're nice and sharp. So they probably put this on the grinder like that. And then just at the very end, they do a little bit of a secondary bevel right at, right at the edge. Um, it keeps them really, really nice and sharp, but when you sharpen them for the first time, there's a temptation of only sharpening that secondary bevel, or if you only put this part against the stone, then you'll never reach the edge, all right? So 
you want to you're basically going to be hitting the high spot and then basically taking that all down from there to there so first time you buy or you sharpen especially with the uh, the swiss made they do this a lot you, there's a lot of metal to remove to get that really right up to the edge and all the way to the heel and again it's very tempting to just do that little upper edge the secondary bevel um, but you're just going to be recreating that secondary bevel so first time you sharpen um, them that you quite often have to deal with that um, <clears throat> well it's a good question but um, typically if you're wanting to do some controlling cuts if you have it flat basically this the when you have it flat like that you're going to be using more like a planing cut all right um, I quite often have my tool the tool where the bevel down and you do sort of sweeping cuts if you have that secondary bevel it's going to want to do this sort of scooping motion it's just naturally the way that the tool is going to do and you're going to have a lot of separate scoops rather than Kind of a sweeping cut now if you are going to be just needing a sharp tool and you're going to be using a mallet and just removing a bunch of wood um, it shouldn't matter too much with that then a sharp tool is a sharp tool but if you're really wanting to do more <clears throat> more of the finesse control cuts it does it definitely makes a difference so if you're uh, and so it, it is interesting if you if you do like a side by side comparison and try to do the same cuts with one, it, it does make a big difference. But... Yes. So if you're removing the secondary bevel, you'll start with the first. Yeah, typically, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The the question is if you're just re if you're removing that secondary bevel, would you start with a a twelve hundred? Yeah, I I would. Um it'll take a little bit longer. But uh, if you're if you're tempted to move it down to like an 800 or something like that, it's going to rough up the edge so badly that you're going to spend more time smoothing it and refining it on the 1200 and on the 8000 that it's it's not really going to save much time. You'd be surprised when you if you start with a you know a 600 or 800 grit stone on a on a tool like this it just if you look closely at it it'll just be like teeth marks in it and uh yeah it's it's pretty amazing so yeah sometimes it, even though it just you feel like it takes a lot longer it's it's gonna it'll still work yes um okay yeah, the question was, would you sharpen it if, if when you buy a brand new tool, do you sharpen it right away and get rid of that secondary bevel? I wouldn't. In fact, I still have some tools here that I bought um, for, for students to use, and I still have the secondary bevel on. Um, so no, they it, it still works. It's just ideally, really. Um, so, but just something you have to deal with when you sharpen them for the first time. And interestingly, I'm looking at the back of this one. If you see that it's kind of lopsided too so um you know i'm not quite sure what's going to happen when i grind it but it could be just the shape of the tool do you see how one side goes down um anyway just going to continue on all right so now take and rock the tool basically so rock the tool so you can feel a flat all right and you can actually this you can actually feel it pretty solidly um and i want to take and set your feet a couple of feet apart and then just going to rotate it all right side to side and what i like to do is physically move across the stone all right so my body actually goes side to side if it's just this movement there's a lot of things that can happen in that movement and uh quite often it ends up creating more of an s shape on it because there's something in that pressure so i try to keep it pretty pretty even side to side and you can see now right now if you can see can you see that one I'm not sure which one would be better to see close up okay now right there you can see it's right at the heel all right where where the marker is disappearing so i really need to lift it up a little bit 
So at this point, it's just hitting the, the heel. Nothing has come off the main part. So if you want to just keep it, uh, maybe aim, aim it down here, but keep, you can keep it close. Thank you. Okay, again, rock the tool until you feel a flat. Lock your hand and lock your elbow and then just move side to side. Okay, and now that's, see now it's, it's, I raised it up just a little bit. Now it's hitting that edge, but you can see there's a little black edge and that's that secondary bevel. So this is one of those tools I haven't touched yet and haven't sharpened from, okay. So still now that was probably lifted up a little too high and then just, all right, now as I rotate it, I want to make sure that I don't over rotate it. All right, if I over rotate it, what's going to happen is those corners are going to come down and kind of soften. Uh, and that's something that you definitely don't want to do with fishtails. The whole point of fishtails is having these nice sharp corners to fit into. However, I just want to show you this. This is actually an example of where you might want to use and, and round those corners so you can customize it. And this is perfect for a ball and claw foot. <laughs> Basically for rounding the, the ball and going into that web. But uh, sometimes you might want to, but if you're gonna customize and, and over rotate basically is how, how this is done, um, you wanna use just the straight ones. So yeah, sometimes, sometimes it does help to, to have that. But generally though, you wanna just do and, all right, and rotate. And if you under rotate and don't reach those corners, what's going to happen is you're going to have this dip down. Um, it's basically going to shape like this. You're going to have the corners sticking up. Okay. All right. So you do this until you get a little wire edge along the inside edge. And it might take you, um, you know, maybe 10 minutes. Just depends on, on how much metal you need to remove. But if you look at that, you can see that it's taken most of the marker off, except there's still that secondary bevel there. So I'm just going to try to keep it in that same position so it takes that flat and just lowers it down. Okay, so you do that until you get a little wire edge. That little wire edge is going to tell you you've reached that the outer, uh, the blade, and you've pushed a little bit of metal forward. It's a tiny micro amount. And <clears throat> So then what you do is you move from the 1200 to the 8000, right? And do the same thing then, same exact position for maybe another four or five minutes, right? At that point, you're just polishing it. And, and it's surprising. I mean, it feels like it's glass. It's really, you can't feel any of the grit on the diamond stones, but it is still pretty aggressive. And you can start seeing that it will really get uh, polished and like a mirror finish. And then once you finish that with the 8,000, okay, so let's go back. So 1,200, maybe about you know eight to 10 minutes, just depends on, on what you need. So 1,200, then you move to the 8,000. And it seems like a huge jump from 1,200 to the 8,000, but it's it works quite well. I actually have a 4,000 grit and I thought, oh, I'll just move through it. And it just takes more time and it wasn't really necessary. So, so uh, I still pretty much jump from 1200 to the 8,000. And then what you do is you basically use these little slip stones. All right, these are Arkansas stones. They're shaped. They've got an area for, the, for a V chisel and also a curve in different sizes. And normally what you would use is uh, oil on these, on the Arkansas stones. But since I'm using water, it seems to work okay. Okay, and then basically go along the inside and you're taking that little wire edge and you're pushing it to the back side. Now, normally I'm doing this for the camera down here, but normally what I do is I hold it up here so I can see, so I can really look down at it and be able to make sure that it's making contact with the edge. Okay. And then once that's gone from the inside, it's flipped it to the backside. Then I put it back on the stone, same position. All right, and that's pushing it back in front. So you don't wanna really do it too aggressive. So you're actually recreating that wire edge. You're just simply dealing with pushing it back and forth 
inside and outside. Okay, until that wire edge completely falls off. And the next stage is using a leather strop. And this is a lovely one from, look, the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers. <laughs> And I actually use this most of the time now. And so this is it's actually kind of neat though. If you look at the way that it's all the different um, angles. Um, and so basically take and drag back. All right. And then you've got the various shapes and that's where you do the inside. And the thing is, as you're carving, um, I probably use the strop a little bit more if it just feels like it might be getting a little bit dull. Then I put it on the strop and just see, because obviously, I mean, you don't want to have to go through the whole stone sharpening process. If it brings it back, and it will sometimes um, bring it fully back to to full sharp tool, just using the leather. And you can use various other things. You can use cardboard. Um, you can, you know, you can use just a, a bare piece of wood. Uh, this is also something that I've um, created. This is something I've had for years where you just have a couple different various uh, variations of, of curves, all right, and just drag back. You can use dowels if you want, but, uh, you know, make, make different custom pieces, of different shapes. Um, and that is pretty much it for the curve gouge. Is there any other questions with those? Are you good with that? Um, I did want to mention something. Um, if you don't have the slip stones, what you can use is really fine sandpaper. Anywhere like 6,000, 8,000 grit sandpaper. You can get it at automotive stores. You can get it at Woodcraft. I don't know exactly what um, mesh or, or grit they are, but you can take that. And so if you have a really tiny tool or an awkward tool, like a little, those little, um, uh, not fishtails, the um, veiners, the U-shaped ones, number 11. If you take and just fold it, sometimes the slip stones won't fit in it. So you just fold it and then use this as a slip stone instead. Uh, and what you could also do is wrap this around dowels and use it the same thing as with the, the slipstone. All right. I know we're kind of running short of time, but I wanted to show you how to sharpen a V-chisel because it probably is the most challenging one to sharpen. Anybody sharpen a V-chisel there? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we know what we're dealing with here. Okay. Um, do, we can do the same thing with the marker, right? And just mark that. Okay, so flat, flat chisel. Okay, so basically what the V chisel is, is you're sharpening it as if it's a flat chisel, on one side and flat chisel on. So however you sharpen flat chisels, you just wanna treat each side the same way, all right? Flat chisel, and then you do that until you get a little wire edge, and then you move to the other side, okay? And if you, if you look at that, basically it's, that's all it is, is just two flat chisels coming down to a corner. And, um, and again, you may have to deal with that secondary bevel on this, Okay, so you do that until you get that wire edge. But I wanted to explain what ends up being the biggest issue with this. And so, so what often happens, I'll just get rid of this. I'm not sure what all that is, but no worries. Okay. okay. Okay, so what happens with the V chisel is you get flat, whoa, <laughs> flat chisel, all right? 
down like that and flat chisel. All right, and then, all right, but I kind of exaggerated that a bit, but basically that corner is not necessarily a sharp inside corner. It's, a, I probably exaggerated the curve a little too much. It's more like that, okay? There is a slight radius to the, to the uh, inside corner. And so what happens is if you take this, all right, if you take this, uh, this is the bevel, if you take that as a flat chisel and that as a flat chisel, quite often what happens, especially if you remove a lot of metal, is that you get this sharp corner on the outside and a slight radius on the inside, which actually produces a little beak of metal. <laughs> all right, how many of you <laughs> experienced that one if you sharpened? Um, so the trick then is to, so we've already got that flat chisel, that flat chisel, and we got the little wire edge, right, along each edge, but you're dealing with this thing now. And so what you want to do is take this lower edge there, and you're basically rounding or sharpening that lower edge as if it is a tiny little curved gouge. And so you're just taking just that edge and you're rounding it same position that you sharpen a curved gouge with, but you rotate it the same way. All right, and surprisingly, that little beak will start getting shorter and shorter as soon as this uh, becomes um, the, the radius on the outside matches the radius on the inside. It's tricky, um, but it's, uh, it's really the only way to get it to, to work. Okay, so, so again, you wanna just line it up like that and then just do a, slight, all right, just a curve, exactly as if it was a, its own curved gouge, all right, and that outer corner then has, will be uh, a slight radius, okay, and that usually is the biggest issue with the V-chisel, although there's all sorts of things that can happen. <laughs> um, if you end up pressing too hard one side or the other when you do the flat chisel part, you're going to end up re-angling the blade, all right, which can do all sorts of fun things because if one's going this way and the other one's going that way, <laughs> that's also easy, easy to happen. All right, but just with, with the V chisel, especially well with all of it, you just want to take your time with it. If you get too uh, impatient with it, uh, that's usually when the mistakes happen. Or if you want it to go faster, so you use a, a rougher um, sharpening stone, and then if you've got it positioned wrong, then it's gonna basically go wrong really quickly. <laughs> um, so, but that's basically the, the biggest issue. So flat chisel, flat chisel, and then round that corner. And then for the inside, for the slip stone, you basically take this, these uh, corner stones and you go one side, right? the inside and then go to to the other so basically you're focusing on one side and then moving to the other side and then back on this side so at this point again similar to the curve gouge you're basically just dealing with getting rid of that wire edge okay and then you can use your the strop i probably use the strop with a v chisel more than anything because more than any other tool because it's just such a pain to sharpen <laughs> so so flat chisel, pull, flat chisel, and then you get a little curve corner. And then this is where you want to take this. Now this, I actually have to replenish the uh, stropping compound on there. Um, it's just a, a honing compound. You can use any kind of honing compound that you use on a buffing wheel. Um, but I actually have been taking this to classes and people go backwards on it. <laughs> it has basically been gouging out this. So you want to pull. <laughs> okay. There. And that is pretty much it. So, and that's when you test it by shaving the hair on your arm. Well, <laughs> that's what my teacher used to do. Yes, yeah? so it was a big bald spot on his, uh, <laughs> on his arm. Anyway, are there any questions about sharpening? It's almost one o'clock. My goodness, I've been rambling on for hours. 
Is there a sharpening service? Um, I don't know. Does Woodcraft even offer it? They do. Okay. There's a guy at Oregon City that was a fine that they didn't know he had a fixed tool that he had. Tom Rich uses him quite a bit for handling gnarly problems. He's apparently good at it. I haven't used it myself. Yeah, and a lot of times if you get antique tools, sometimes they need to be seriously repaired or or adjusted. Um uh, that then it's a whole different thing. I mean, you could end up, um, you know, re-angling, re-angling tools. Sometimes you might have to um, put on a grinder. Um, I actually haven't used a, um, a grinder for probably 15 or 20 years on a tools since I discovered diamond stones, because you can use like a 300 or 400 grit diamond stone and do the same that a grinder will do um, but a little bit more control, you know, if um, I've always found any, I mean, there's all sorts of machines out there. I think you guys have some sharpening machines, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can do some pretty, pretty good sharpening, but you could also destroy a tool really quickly too, if it's not, if you don't have it positioned correctly. But the funny thing is I've discovered that um, by, by doing all the, sh the sharpening by hand, you really, really get to know the shape of that tool. And when I um, when I first started, I think it probably took 20 hours to sharpen my first tool because there was like this thick thickness of metal. And I knew that tool. <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing if you have an old hand plane or something and you refurbish it, you spend you know two days refurbishing it, you're gonna be very respectful of that tool and you're gonna appreciate it and you're gonna know it really well. And, uh, you know, I was mentioning about the being able to visualize the sizes of the tools. Um, you know, as I say, just kind of get spoiled with these big numbers stamped on the on the handles. When I first started carving, um, you know, I said taking, you know, take 15, 20 hours to sharpen one of the tools. And you really get to know the shape of that tool. And um, as I said, you respect it. and um, so when I started teaching, I was using whatever tool I was using. And the question was, well, what tool are you using? Well, the one that works. <laughs> so I had to actually look at it and try to figure out what's, what's the number of the tool. So I never really paid attention to the numbers until I started teaching. So I, I basically uh, recognized the tools by looking at the blade and understanding and recognizing the blade rather than relying on on being able to see the numbers. So if you can get to that point where you really know the actual curvatures of the blades, um, it's it's almost easier to identify it because then you're basically using it where that curve is making sense with the next cut that I'm making rather than thinking, oh, it should be a 514 or a seven or something like that, um, where you're actually identifying the shape with the shape that what you're using. So, you know, so sometimes just, you know, taking that time to really, really, you know, sharpen the tools and getting to know that, that tool, it can, it can help. It, it create a relationship with your tools. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now the question was, the, the question was in, in, in light of that, how do I organize my tools? I wish I was organized enough. Um, I, I do, I, well, when I have, when I, I, I hang them up on my wall in my workshop on magnets, okay? That's about as organized as I get. I have them, number ones try to stay together, number twos, number threes, okay? So I do organize them in that way. But once they get out here, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, yes, in that perfect world, it would be great if you could just sort of you know, line it up and put them exactly back where where they came from. But I'm not. I'm not that organized. Um, it ends up being this sort of crowd of of tools after a while. Um, but yeah, if you can do that now. Also, I was going to mention what I uh, in that ideal world, but mine sort of becomes a little bit more chaotic. Um, 
have them all lined up so the blades are actually pointing towards you. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive having these nice sharp tools pointing towards you. Um, but again, if you're actually identifying it by the blade and not necessarily by the handle, then you want them to be as, as close as possible visually. So if you're working here, you just look up and you can identify by the blade. And so, you know, that would be, again, in that ideal world, but sometimes mine get tossed all over the place. <laughs> Question? Are you talking about the, the the current sort of wood carving environment? What are the current trends? That's a good question. You know, this whole sort of society of American period furniture makers, these are people who really get into, you know, reproducing the 18th century furniture, as I said, you know, ball and claw foot, the, a lot of the things that I showed up there. Um, that is actually, it's, it's continuing to, um, be of interest, but it seems to me that it's more sort of gearing towards the retired people. A lot of retired engineers <laughs> are into the period furniture. Um, so it's a good question, and I'm not quite sure where sort of the future is, because I'm trying to sort of assess where the, the young people are kind of more interested in and where that will go. Um, but it seems like there's they're more into doing the um, the 3D printing and and now now a big thing is the CNC um, machines that are out there. Uh, so yeah, it ends up being the the people who are interested in doing the carving are interested in just the the process of it, not necessarily you know wanting to to build furniture or you know that type of thing, but they're wanting to learn the process of of shaping tool or sh shaping wood with tools. Um, and that's what I've found with um, with teaching. Uh, doesn't matter what you're what you're wanting to do, whether you're wanting to do sculpture, whether you're wanting to do furniture, anything like that. Um, it's wanting to learn the technique that after a day of carving or two days of carving, you can look at it and say, "Look what I carved." Um, but uh, I don't. It's it's hard to say what what the future is showing. People, I think, are turning back to wanting to make things and wanting just the experience of actually making something with their hands and saying, you know, at the end of the day, look, look what I made and um, feeling that sense of accomplishment. Um, from a, you know, an actual professional standpoint, I don't know if I would actually be able to survive on commissions. Uh, there's just not enough out there. Um, that's why I teach. <laughs> so sorry, so, but, but no. when, when you make these cards, do you almost like prefer that you can like see the marks of accomplish or mm. say as, as perfect as possible? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question was about hand tool, leaving hand tool marks in the in the wood. What what do I prefer? Um, I don't like to sand. <laughs> so I actually kind of like the look of of the hand tool, it kind of keeps a little bit lively. Um, and then and then there's the challenge of trying to get a, a, a nice smooth surface without the tool marks in it and actually just go right off the tool. Um, so I, I generally prefer to not aim to sanding or I certainly don't like to rely on sanding. Um, but then there's there are times when you're trying to duplicate something and trying to have that really, really smooth sort of satiny finish, uh, which you kind of have to just rely on the, the sanding. But I generally try to stay away from it. I'm kind of that's that's sort of where my purest part of it is like, oh, keep the sandpaper away. <laughs> so, yeah. In the world of stone carving. Yes. Thinking about beginning stone carving, which I have never attempted at all. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend a beginning project, a beginning tool, and a beginning material? Sure. Um, so uh, the question was about stone carving, about how to get started with that. Um, generally, I would suggest uh, you can go into art supply stores. Uh, Alabaster is a good one to start out with. And um, 
also soapstone those two are really good and they usually can you can usually find a chunk of stone that's quite workable um but yeah those two are really good ones to start out with and just get one or two chisels stone chisels and a, and a mallet uh, the, the interesting thing is when you think about basically you you have a flat chisel anything convex can be carved with a flat chisel because it's just a series of sweeps all right if you're doing anything concave then you need obviously a curved one um, but generally anything stone carving anything that is convex is always shaped with a flat chisel um, Stone. Yes, you can. I mean, alabaster, you can literally get a, just a simple cold chisel. It'll, it'll cut. Um, but if you're starting to work with anything that's a little bit harder, marble, definitely granite, which I wouldn't recommend carving granite at all. Um, then you, you're going to want to use what's called tungsten carbide tipped stone chisels. And England, in England, they sell them. I think a, a company called Taranti, T-R-A-N-T-I. Um, they sell the tungsten carbide tipped. Uh, they're quite expensive, but the only way to sharpen those are actually on diamond stones. Nothing else will, will get them sharpened. Uh, so yeah, um, you get the basically a couple, a couple chisels, a stone carving mallet and stone and just hack away. <laughs> That's how I started. I mean, I basically just it started experimenting and discovered how it worked. No, you don't want to use wood carving. No, uh, no, just stone special stone, stone carving chisels. Um, yes, uh, yeah. And soapstone um, is really quite soft. You can actually use, a, um, you can actually sand it um, and to shape it. Um, I haven't actually done, I've, a lot of the stone that I've used was alabaster, which it's, it's soft enough that where you it doesn't feel like you're carving on it for two weeks without getting any more <laughs> so yeah I'd, I'd recommend probably alabaster to start with is there grain in the stone or is it generally no that's why when uh, a lot of times people who are stone carvers and move to wood carving really get frustrated because <laughs> all of a sudden with stone you're you're dealing with you know the freedom of you know going whichever direction you want uh, and then you go to wood carving and like wait a minute it's not letting me go that direction <laughs> yes oh, how do you repair the, <laughs> the broken talking about how to repair these pieces um yeah we had some kind of mishaps on i think they played football with my luggage um but if you see that right there, can you zoom in? Oops, right there. So nice, a nice clean, fortunately, a nice clean cut right there or clean break. But um, with this type of thing, you can either just use regular wood glue or super glue if you want to use that. Um, but you can, you know, as, as long as it's a nice clean cut like that, it actually isn't going to show very much at all. Um, it's not structural necessarily so you could probably just sit and hold it um, but if you want to just try to do some clamping they also have those spring clamps have you ever seen those for basically this wire that's a it's a tight wire that basically is curved around like that and sometimes that holds onto uh, little delicate pieces it's kind of like a it's a spring spring wire i don't know what i don't exactly know what it's called but um, then it basically it pokes into the side, comes up this way, and then curves around that way, and it um, it holds it quite tightly. So that's helpful in really kind of awkward things where you can't necessarily put a, a clamp there. Um, and uh, yeah, it happens, <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you have to throw it out. And that's one of the things that I think um, uh, is the biggest thing to to learn in a beginning class is if you end up sort of making a mistake like that or or something goes flying off it's not the end of the world you don't have to throw your whole piece off piece out there's all sorts of things you can do you can you know redesign it's called the redesign opportunity <laughs> of just do a little bit more carving out of that area um or 
glue it back. I generally, you know, except for something like that, I generally, if I'm carving something and it kind of breaks, I generally don't glue it back. I just do a design adjustment, but that's a little different. <laughs> and there's another, where's that other one that broke? Oh yeah, here we go. This is a little bit more. This is another one of my disasters that happened. I'm not quite sure what what they did with this one either, but this is going to be a little bit of an issue because it broke in a weird place and it's not fitting back in nicely, All right? So I think I'm gonna get it as close as possible and then maybe do a little bit of little wood filler putty just to sort of visually so it doesn't, but you see what happened if you can see that, but basically it's it actually broke. So anyway, it's not going to fit real nice. And... So what sort of wood filler or putty might you recommend? Um, you can get some pretty nice. Hmm? Yeah, well, actually, but that is just visually. Yeah, I probably wouldn't carve afterwards, but it's really more just to try to match the color and then just fill in the crack, really. Uh, at that point, you prob I probably wouldn't carve anymore. Um, and but it's really just you know sort of covering up the crack early. So and that's actually for a customer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was going to show you actually. This is the reason I brought this is because we're talking about sort of future. <laughs> this is actually a, a rubber mold of that. So I made. So what I did was basically you put a. Uh, an edge, a wall around the carving. All right, here, I'll, I'll explain that. Let's just take the broken piece. Basically stick that down, build a wall around it. I just use cardboard, All right? You put a release agent on it. You need to make sure you put a release agent on it. Um, brush it along there. Then you pour the rubber into there. So it covers this and also is uh, surrounded by that, the wall, right? Then you, once that's, cured then you can pull this off all right that's what the result is it's really accurate i mean it will be so accurate if you've got like a little pinhole you'll have this little string or a little floppy thing of uh <laughs> rubber um that will actually go into the nail hole all right and then what you do is you take resin and you pour resin into this and that's what you get so you get an exact duplicate of the wood piece so this is the same material that I we used for the rotation one, but that was more of just covering the surface of it rather than this is solid. I mean, if you look at the back, that's so, you know, the thing is with this, if you're just going to be painting it, you could just do this and, you know, put it on top of little columns or, uh, you know anything like that or put it on a fireplace mantle or something uh so if it's painted it doesn't really show that's as i said my my purest <laughs> my purest carving uh techniques have just gone right out the window <laughs> so anyway questions done all right thank you <laughs> So who's all going to be in the classes in the next, uh, you're going to be in uh, the class for tomorrow? Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> you might hear some of the same stuff. <laughs> this is a little bit more thorough. <laughs> so yeah, if you, yeah, feel free if you want to look through books here um take this off okay what's that when you say you I mean what is this material that is a silicone rubber just as, and yep. pretty easy yeah. to come by. Yeah. uh it's expensive yeah but but yeah it's a two part uh, yeah. okay yeah it's a it's a two part mix um i mean i get it by the 5 gallon bucket cuz i make a lot of them but um it's like 900 dollars now for 5 gallons yeah yeah it's pretty pretty expensive 